Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Inko Becomes Joker? The author of this story is Jojaflo from fanfiction.net.now. Let's dive into the fanfic. In a darkened room, a shape moved under the covers of a full-sized bed before a shock of green hair appeared followed by the face of an unusually pale woman in a deep purple nightgown. She crawled out of bed looking back at the small body that had been sleeping next to her as she tucked in the covers and made her way to the bathroom. Turning on the light, the face of this woman was revealed. Her pale skin and bloodshot green eyes staring back at her in the mirror, but her most noticeable feature were the scars that ran along the side of her mouth, stretching it into an unnaturally large smile. Always smiling. She giggled to herself as she began her morning routine before changing into a purple suit with a pinstripe green shirt and polished shoes. Can't forget the most important part. She whispered to herself as she placed a flower in her breast pocket. This woman was the Joker one of the most dangerous villains in Japan's second, only to the man who'd broken a city. She was once called Inko Midoriya, but that name no longer holds any meaning to her anymore. As Joker inspected herself in the mirror, she heard shuffling as her young charge got out of bed in a white nightgown speckled with tiny red hearts. Joker, what are you doing? asked young Iri holding onto Joker's pant leg. Joker kneeled down, petting Iri's head. I've got an important meeting with Izuku, so I need to leave early. You stay here and I'll be back. She whispered kissing Iri on the forehead as the young girl pouted. I want to see Izuku too. She said sniffling a little as Joker petted her head. You will, Irei, but this is something the two of us need to do. Joker said, picking Irei up and settling her in the bed again before making her way to the door and stepping outside before locking it again. She looked at the hallway with its playing card symbols carved into the walls and spray painted with ha ha down the walls. She smiled at this. This was the Joker family hall, all her girls were in the rooms on this hall. She walked down the hall hearing whining from behind one door as something pounded against it. Joker leaned against the door stroking it. SHHH it'll be better soon just let it happen. She whispered the only response she received was soft crying that brought a smile to her face as she left exiting the Yua dorms. Apparently before Bane kicked their teeth in Yua was thinking about initiating a full dorm system. Oh well at least they didn't go to waste. She grinned as the first rays of morning appeared in front of her as she burst into laughing skipping along to the main school building. She stepped up onto the entrance, seeing the guards there immediately take a defensive stance to her presence. She smiled walking past them as both men looked at her giving a shudder. The Joker was terrifying they didn't know why the boss let her stay here she was crazy. Joker walked through the main halls of Yua making her way up the stairs to her son's office. Izuku spent most of his time here, she wished he would take better care of himself, but she wouldn't nag, nope she wasn't that kind of mother. Joker knocked on the door to the office before pulling it open her face, splitting into an unnaturally wide grin as she lay eyes on her son. He was sitting on the couch in the office curling a huge dumbbell in his hand as he looked at the screen of the TV. She took notice of everything about Izuku and the man he'd become as if he was liable to disappear again. Joker clenched her fist as if strangling that thought. Not again I won't lose him again, she thought walking into the room. Izuku turned to her, his green eyes a mirror image of hers, but whereas his were filled with cold dominance hers danced with a light of madness. The two stared at one another for what seemed like ages, Inko taking in Izuku's light brush of green hair. He'd need a haircut soon, but she wished he would grow it out again. His body was like stone-hardened muscle bunched beneath his skin filled with explosive potential. You're here, he said to her drawing Joker from her memorization. She smiled again. Of course I am Izuku. I'll always be here for you whenever you need me and sometimes when you don't. She said reaching to tap his nose, but he turned away from her. Joker felt a stab in her heart as she grit her teeth. I want to touch you. She hissed mentally as Izuku stood up. Don't call me that. I'm not Izuku Midoriya and you are clearly no longer his mother Inko Midoriya. Bane said as Joker gave an angry hum. Your mother... She whispered her eyes hidden behind her light green hair as her fist shook. I'm your mother, she shouted looking at him as tears of blood ran down her eyes, but still the smile never left her face as she looked at him. A dichotomy of sadness and joy. Izuku looked at her his eyes never changing even at her outburst. Such a reaction would have shocked some, but Izuku simply stared at her. What happened to you? he asked simply as Joker wiped her face smearing the blood away from her eyes. I know I failed you, Izuku. 
I, I wasn't the mother you needed, but now that we're here, and we've both clearly changed, maybe we could start over and be a family again. I want to be there for you. Just give me a chance. She said smiling as she grabbed his hand. You worked so hard to get where you are and so did I to get closer to you. Admittedly my way was more fun. We're at the top of the food chain, but if you have no more use for me, then kill me. She said placing his hand on her neck. It should be easy for you, and I have no purpose without you. She whispered as Izuku snatched his hand away from her. I don't need a mother, that ship has sailed, but I do need your expertise. But first I need to know what happened to you. How did you get here? He asked gesturing to her entire body. My men don't trust you and frankly neither do I. The things you've done are hardly trustworthy, so before we go any further tell me what happened. He said sitting down on the couch with Joker sighing in relief before taking the spot next to him and looked at him. I had a good day. Inko Midoriya walked out of the hospital doors looking back and forth as she walked up to an ambulance opening the door and after searching around found the keys. She smiled feeling the sting of her cuts as she looked back at Ray. Well come on Ray we need to scram. She said helping the other woman into the passenger side before climbing in herself. Safety first, Inko said gleefully clicking her seatbelt before turning on the ambulance and punching the gas as the ambulance roared out of the parking lot. Inko always living within walking distance of most things she needed, and not having a job never got her driver's license this showed with her reckless driving, if not for the sirens atop the vehicle people would have taken bigger notice of the novice driver. Ha ha ha, Inko shouted as she rounded a corner feeling the ambulance tip to the side before dropping back onto four wheels as she roared down the street. Um, I Inko, where are we going? Ray asked having braced herself against the manic twists and turns. Inko looked at Ray. Oh well I need to drop by my house obviously, I can't meet Izuku like this. She said gesturing to the straight jacket and scrubs and bare feet. Don't worry I should have something that fits you too. She said as she clicked off the siren and parked the car a block or so away from her home and climbed out. Come on Ray I'd love to show you my home. She said reaching in the back of the ambulance and grabbing several scalpels which she held in the sleeves of her straight jacket as the two women made their way to the Midoriya household. Hisashi Midoriya was watching the news and shook his head. I can't believe this is happening. He said as the news showed a destroyed building where heroes were fighting some kind of monsters straight out of a horror flick. Hisashi then heard the front door open and stood up immediately. He knew that he'd locked the door, so someone must have picked the lock, and with all the escaped villains he knew what he'd need to do. I don't know who you are, but you picked the wrong home, he said walking around the corner with a bat and breathing fire as he saw who was at the door. The bat fell from his hands as his fire breath sputtered out. He was looking at his wife whom he had committed only a few days ago. I and Co. He whispered as Inko's eyes flicked to him the smile never leaving her face. Hisashi, what are you doing here? I would have figured you'd be back overseas by now. She said apparently excited to see her husband as she walked up to him and wrapped her arms around his waist. Especially after throwing me in the psych ward. She whispered harshly against his ear causing the man to step back. How are you here? No one called me about you being released. Hisashi said as Inko smiled at him before walking past him. Come on Ray, I'll show you my clothes. Inko said waving her guest into her home as Hisashi took notice of the woman for the first time. H hello. Ray whispered slipping around him as Hisashi looked her over the gaunt face, the seemingly dead eyes. No doubt she was another missing patient from the hospital. Hisashi couldn't let this go on. Inko, that is enough, you are not well. I'm taking you back to the hospital. He said walking back to the living room in order to call the police but felt the phone be yanked from his hand and fly into Inkos. I'm not going back to the hospital, Hisashi. I need to find Izuku. He's out there somewhere and needs M. Hisashi felt his patience snap as he walked up to Inko and grabbed her shoulders. Izuku is dead, Inko, Hisashi roared as he shook his wife. He's dead, don't you understand that, Inko? He's been gone for months and there's been no sign of him. He is gone and he's not coming back, Inko. He was my son too, and I loved him just as much as you did, but I can't keep denying what's in front of me anymore. I've planned to have Izuku's funeral soon, so we can all say goodbye and move on with our lives. He set his eyes pouring with tears as he gripped Inko's shoulders. Hisashi wiped the tears from his eyes and felt a chill run through his body as he stared into Inko's dark green eyes. These weren't the beautiful leaf green eyes he'd fallen in love with during college.
No, these eyes were dark and filled to the brim with hatred. Hisashi grunted as he felt a pain in his stomach. He looked down seeing Inko had stabbed him in the gut with a scalpel only to pull it out and stab into him again. How could you say that Hisashi? You loved him as much as I did that's ridiculous, Inko growled stabbing Hisashi again. I was here with him every day, I changed his diapers, helped him with his homework, cried with him when he found out he didn't have a quirk. He is my son, Inko shouted wrenching away from Hisashi and went to stab him in the neck only for Hisashi to block her blow the two falling to the ground in front of the TV with Inko sitting on top of Hisashi, the scalpel in her hand inches away from Hisashi's throat as the two struggled. Normally this would be a no contest between the two parents. Hisashi was stronger than Inko, but feeling his blood draining out of him, and with it his strength. Hisashi felt the tip of the scalpel break the skin of his neck as a large boom was heard on the television drawing both away from their life and death struggle. Inko stared at the screen as the cameraman climbed free of the helicopter and zeroed in on Bane's face having finally been revealed. It was a young man with green eyes and freckles upon his face, but to Inko it couldn't be anyone other than her son. Izuku, Inko shouted dropping the scalpel as she rushed to the TV screen staring at her baby boy. He looked so strong standing there covered in wounds, but still standing strong. At this moment Inko remembered something from long ago, a memory she had up until this point tried to forget and erase, but came back to her with startling clarity. It was the video of All Might's debut that Izuku loved to watch so much. Back then she'd found it scary all the fire the wounded people, and even All Might himself standing there covered in injuries and smiling while carrying injured people. It scared her but seeing her son now standing there smiling brutally as he faced All Might. Hisashi stared at the screen, the pain he'd felt from Inko stabbing him was a distant thought as he stared at his son as he did the unthinkable and broke All Might across his knee. Hisashi's head fell to the floor as tears clouded his vision. In this moment he'd lost everything. His wife was insane and his son was a murderer. He'd failed as both a husband and father. You were right Inko, but is this really what you wanted? Are you happy? he asked looking over to his wife, and the smile of pure joy on her face made his stomach twist and knot. So happy Hisashi, my baby is alive, and he's living his dream. She whispered moving over to her husband and wrapping her hands around his face as Hisashi coughed. He wanted to be a hero in Ko, that right there is a villain. Hisashi shouted before feeling in Ko's hands slide around his neck and squeeze as she laughed. No 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 Izuku is a hero, Izuku is always the hero and if you can't understand that or get in his way you're a villain," she shouted as she began to choke her husband. Hisashi struggled fruitlessly his body weak from blood loss. Izuku doesn't need you, he never did, all he needs is me. She hissed as Hisashi began losing consciousness. Inkuo. Hisashi stopped moving as Inko slowly let go of his throat and stood up. Her hands covered in her husband's blood as she turned to the TV, seeing a blown up image of her son, and she smiled. Don't worry Izuku I'll be there for you this time I promise," Inko said moving away from her husband's corpse and rounding the couch seeing Rei holding her hands against her ears her eyes squeezed tightly shut and her knees to her chest. Inko crouched down in front of Rei. Sorry about that Rei sweetheart, just a lover's spat. We've decided to see other people. Inko said with a smile as she held out a hand to Rei helping her to her feet and quickly turned her head away from Hisashi's corpse. Look, let's get ready, we need to look our best for our sons. She said as she took Inko to her room and threw open the closet yanking shirts and dresses down before reaching the back of her closet and pulled out a large hanging bag and unzipped it showing off a purple suit with a green tie and dress shirt and purple pants. She smiled as she pulled it out and looked at it. I'm going to tell you a secret, Ray. Inko said as she tore off the straight jacket and scrubs before getting dressed in the suit. Before I met Hisashi and became a housewife, I was in school to become a psychiatrist. Can you believe that? But after I met Hisashi I left that behind. She whispered as she buttoned up her shirt. As she spoke Ray began to get dressed in some of the things Inko had thrown around the room. But I still remember what I learned, and I think it's going to come in handy Ray. She said as she moved to the mirror and fluffed her hair a couple times her once dark green locks having lightened from stress turning a sickly lime green as she took the brightest red lipstick and applied it to her lips. She smiled her scars drawing her smile even wider. You know my son Izuku idolized All Might because he never stopped smiling and now neither can I. Inko shouted happily laughing out loud as she turned away from the mirror. 
Inko flipped her mattress and reached for the gun she'd kept under the bed. Hisashi had bought this for her when he first received his overseas assignment. Inko had been terrified of the weapon, but kept it just in case, and now seemed like the perfect time. I think you'll come in handy, she said as she loaded the gun and slammed it shut before putting it in her inner coat pocket. I'm armed and dangerous, Inko shouted happily as she looked at Ray, who was in one of her light blue sweaters and jeans. Don't worry, Ray will be getting you something a lot better looking. In fact, I know the perfect place to do a little shopping. I've been meaning to pay a visit to my old friend Mitsuki after she did me such a kindness. Inko growled tracing the scars on her face as she walked out of her room going to the living room. She looked around the home she'd shared with her son for so long before going into kitchen and turning the gas on the stove all four burners releasing their deadly fumes before reaching into drawer and grabbing handfuls of silverware and shoved them in the microwave before turning it on and sauntering out the front door with Ray right on her heels. Taking one last look at Hisashi, she waved and slammed the door as she and Ray walked away to the ambulance they'd stolen and climbed in. Inko started the machine as an explosion rocked the block as fire blazed from the top of the apartment building. Inko began driving off, not even looking back, wearing a morbid smile of joy as she laughed into the night. Mitsuki Bakugu looked at the screen, she was racked with a whirlwind of emotions, seeing the number one hero be brutally murdered. Heart was in her throat as her eyes burned with unshed tears. She felt her husband's hand on her hand squeezing tightly as the two looked on at the screen. But then there was a knock at the door drawing them from the miserable scene before them. Mitsuki stood up and went to the door. She thought it must have been Katsuki returning after leaving several hours ago. If not for the tragedy she had just seen, she would have wondered why her son was knocking at their door, instead of simply unlocking it with his key. Mitsuki opened the door and her pupils shrank as she stared down the barrel of a gun. She took in a breath to shout, but the person before her pulled the trigger. Mitsuki felt a punch to her gut and an intense burning as she fell to the ground her last sight being green eyes and ringing laughter. Inko looked at the bleeding Mitsuki on the floor and giggled loudly as she stepped into the Bakugu home. Masu Bakugu rounded the corner of their home slamming into the wall as he looked at his wife lying on the ground and the two women in his doorway one of them being Inko Midoriya. Mitsuki, Masaru shouted stepping forward only for Inko to shoot an inch from his foot. Now, now Masaru your wife is sleeping try not to be so loud. Inko said as she stepped forward and as she did so she curled her hand and immediately Mitsuki's body started to move towards her dragging along the ground as she moved deeper into the house. Ray be a darling and get the door would you? She asked as Ray did just that shutting and locking the door gently. Now Masaru if you'd be a good boy and grab two chairs from the kitchen and an extension cord if you have it. She instructed as if this was routine to the both of them. Dobby what do you need that for? He asked as Inko placed the barrel of the gun against her head. Please hold your questions until after the presentation Masaru. Now would you please go get the things I've asked for? I'd hate to ask again. She said pointing the gun downwards at Mitsuki's face. The threat was clear as Masaru rushed to do as he was told. Ray, why don't you go raid Mitsuki's closet? I'm sure she's got something more your style. Inko said as Ray rubbed her shoulder. Um, th, that's okay, Inko. I, I don't mind wearing this. She said brushing her fingers along the sleeve of the sweater. To be honest, in Inko's clothes, she felt more coherent and warm than she had in several years. Inko looked at Ray and shrugged. If you say so, Ray, I wouldn't want to make you uncomfortable. Inko said with a grin as Masaru appeared with the two chairs. Wonderful, now place them in front of each other and then tie your bitch wife to one of them. Inko growled as she kicked Mitsuki's body towards Masaru who glared at Inko as the green-haired woman smiled waving the gun. Don't get any fun ideas, I've got enough shots left in here to turn the two of you into Swiss cheese. Inko hissed her smile bright in the darkened interior of the home. Masaru swallowed as he moved towards Mitsuki's body doing his best to gently place and tie her in the chair. The movement seemed to wake Mitsuki who groaned at the pain in her stomach. She hissed as she looked at Masaru who cupped her face. Mitsuki oh thank god you're alive. I I thaug. At that moment Inko slammed the butt of the gun over Masaru's head dropping him to the ground. This shocked Mitsuki into full consciousness. Masaru, Inko you twisted bitch. Mitsuki shouted remembering fully who had done this to her. Inko smiled happily as she held her hand over Masaru's head, using her quirk to pull his head into her hand and grip it by the hair as she pulled him into the chair across from Mitsuki and tied him up as well. 
Good to see you up and awake, Mitsuki. This wouldn't be nearly as fun with you unconscious. Inko whispered, pulling Masaru's head back and shaking it until the man awoke from his impromptu nap. Woo? Masaru groaned as Inko let his head drop and walked over to Mitsuki, and with the flick of her wrist produced a scalpel and sliced open the blonde woman's shirt and bra nicking her chest, some as the clothing fell open which Inko ripped off her before doing the same to her pants. Mitsuki sat naked in the chair in front of her husband. But far from being embarrassed, she simply glared at Inko before taking notice of Rei. Are you just going to stand there and let her do what she wants to us? You're a villain just like he. Mitsuki was interrupted as Inko pistol whipped her blood flying to the ground as Masaru growled fighting against his bonds. Masaru had never been a man known for his temper, but right now he wished he could explode like his son. Don't say another word to her. I'm the one doing this Ray has nothing to do with it. She's just a good friend something I've needed for a long time, but was stuck with you, Inko shouted in Mitsuki's ears. Ray blushed at Inko's kind words. For such a long time she'd seen herself as useless or worthless. Her husband had beaten her and then locked her in the psych ward because of her inabilities. She hadn't seen her youngest son in so long. He's probably grown to be more like Enji now. The thought of her cute Shoto being turned into a monster like her husband made her colder than she'd ever felt in her life. But to know that Inko thought this much of her, it made her feel like she mattered again. Now then, Mitsuki, I have a lot of things to get off my chest, so you're just going to sit there and listen. Inko said before stabbing into Mitsuki's arm with her scalpel driving the blade deep into her flesh. Blood ran down Mitsuki's arm dripping off her elbow as the blonde woman clenched her teeth. She wouldn't give Inko the satisfaction of hearing her scream. You've always been a bitch, Mitsuki, but like they say, better the devil you know right. I was too scared to go out and meet other people, so I was stuck with you. But not anymore after our little spat, I realized that the world is as cruel or as kind as you make it. And after everything that's happened, I want to be really cruel. Inko punctuated this with another scalpel to Mitsuki's leg, and once more the blonde only let out a low groan. Masaru was tugging at his bonds to the point he had torn a lot of the skin from around his wrists, the cord binding his wrist growing slick with blood. Inko, stop this. Leave her alone. Torture me instead. Just don't hurt my wife anymore. He shouted rocking in his chair to the point he tipped it over slamming the man to his side on the floor. Inko turned to face Masaru, her smile still in place. Sorry Masaru, I've got something special for you. So just sit there and wait your turn all right, pumpkin. She said as Mitsuki looked at her former friend. Inko had never been a woman to get angry or lash out at people, and that was something Mitsuki had respected and admired about her friend. After all, Mitsuki lost her temper at a moment's notice, but not Inko, and now her friend was torturing her. What is this Inko? Revenge for your son, or are you just showing where he got all his crazy? Mitsuki shouted looking up at Inko, who stared down at her before bursting out laughing. Oh no, nothing like that. My Izuku is strong enough to do whatever he wants. This right here is the beginning of a joke. After all, there's one thing that makes people laugh more than anything, pain. People are sadists they love to see others in pain. A woman falls down in a pair of heels and twists her ankle, or a kid tries a skateboard trick and falls flat on his face. We all laugh at first, it's only after that do we act to help. So yes, I'm going to make everyone laugh at each other's pain starting with you. Inko said staring down at Mitsuki as she began to laugh. Hours pass the only sound is Inko's laughter as Masaru looked on his eyes dry from all his crying, and throat raw from his shouting. He could no longer feel his hands from all his struggling. He stared at the unrecognizable corpse of his wife. Large patches of skin were missing from Mitsuki's torso exposing her ribs. Mitsuki's eyes were gone leaving bloody empty sockets her mouth split open in a grotesque grin. Her exposed breasts were covered in bleeding cuts and no longer rising with breaths. Masru panted as his dry eyes moved to look at a bloodied Inko. While she lasted longer than I thought, Inko said as she turned to Masaru wiping one of her bloody gloves across her forehead to remove the sweat and leaving a bloodstain there. Masaru, are you familiar with the suspension bridge effect? Inko asked not getting a response from Masaru. Well, it's the reason that guys take girls to scary movies. It goes that when a person is put in a stressful situation, alongside the opposite sex that person will mistake their fear for attraction. Masru looked at Inko his mind, not being able to connect the dots until Inko reached for his pants. No. He whispered as Inko began laughing. Let's put it to the test. She whispered. 
Dagaba police stood outside the home of the Bakugu family. Detective Tsukachi had just arrived, and this was the last place he wanted to be after all. His best friend had died this night. But when it rains it pours apparently. On the heels of learning of All Might's death, he'd been called here to arguably the most brutal murder he'd seen in his years on the force. What happened? Tsukachi asked as the lead forensics explained. Yes, sir victim is female names Mitsuki Bakugu cause of death looks like blood loss. She appears to have been tortured, sir. There are multiple stab wounds areas of skin have been removed along with her eyes. She was shot before the torture began and there is also some vaginal damage. The male forensic swallowed taking note of the female staff here before continuing. Well it looks as if something sharp was inserted inside and maneuvered rather violently. He explained as several female staff gave hisses of pain. Tsukachi took all this in for a moment before speaking. There was mention of a survivor. He said as one of the patrolmen took over the explanation. Yes sir a Mr. Masrubakuu. He was rushed to the hospital he was in shock. He was found in a state of undress. The patrolman spoke as Tsukachi massaged the bridge of his nose. Anything else? he asked as the patrolman nodded. Yes, Sir Mr. Bakugu only repeated one word repeatedly, Joker. Tsukachi grabbed his chin as he walked out. All right, continue your work here, I'll be heading to the hospital and notify me immediately if anything else is found. As Tsukachi walked outside he could hear shouting and walked around the corner seeing a blonde-haired boy shouting at his officers. Get the fuck out of my way that's my house. Where are my parents? What happened? He continued to shout as Tsukachi walked up to the cordon recognizing Bakugu Katsuki. Bakugu do you remember me? I'm Detective Tsukachi and I'm in charge of this investigation. Bakugu stopped his shouting for a moment as he looked at Tsukachi. Yeah you were with All Might after the Ostia attack. Tsukachi nodded as he walked past the cordon. Come with me I'll take you to your father. Tsukachi said as Bakugu followed after him picking up on the fact that the detective hadn't mentioned his mother. What about my mom, where is she? He asked climbing into the passenger seat as Tsukachi started the car and began driving not responding to Bakugu's question. Damn it I asked where my mom is, he shouted again as Tsukachi sighed. She's dead Bakugu, she was tortured and murdered. Tsukachi said bluntly there was no way to spare Katsuki from this. He'd learned that years ago there was no way to gently tell someone this, so the best way was as bluntly as possible. Katsuki's head fell forward it felt as if his entire core had been ripped from him. He was empty now there was nothing inside him now. Until now he'd been filled with anger and a thirst for revenge, but after this that flame of righteous fury guttered out leaving nothing but an ice-cold void. I'm sorry Bakugu, but no I will find the villain who did this. Tsukachi vowed as they pulled into the hospital, and after finding the hospital room Masaru was in. They found him asleep in his hospital bed. Katsuki walked into the room as Tsukachi went to find the doctor and speak with him about Mr. Bakugu's condition. What can you tell me doctor? Tsukachi asked as the doctor rubbed his face. Well there's no doubt he was sexually assaulted. There were traces of vaginal secretions on him, but other than that he's physically fine. There was a bruise to the back of his head, but that's already been taken care of. I'm worried for his psychological well-being after something like this. I'm suggesting he stay here for observation and to speak with a psychologist about this Joker character. There was that name again. What is this Joker he keeps talking about? Tsukachi asked as the doctor nodded. I'm not sure myself it could be just his way of coping with the attack by distancing his attacker with a moniker, or it could be what his attacker told him to call her. Tsukachi sighed knowing he wouldn't be able to get much from Masru Bakugu tonight. It would be best to leave the father and son alone for the night. Katsuki stepped in seeing his father sleeping fitfully on the hospital bed. His head went from side to side as he muttered in his sleep drenched in sweat. Katsuki walked to his father's side and placed a hand on his arm. Masaru's eyes bucked open roving in their sockets as he lashed out punching his son in the chest before he realized what he was doing. K hey, Katsuki, I, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. Masaru said gripping his head as flashes of what happened tore through his mind like shrapnel. It's okay dad, you're safe now. Katsuki said looking at his father, he'd hardly felt the blow to his chest, whether that was from his father's weak punch or his numbness he wasn't sure. This would be the first time Katsuki looked at his father really looked at him. Growing up he hadn't thought much of his father he was his dad, and he loved him, but he wasn't what Katsuki pictured as an image of a man. 
His father was soft-spoken and clam deferring to his mother for most things. It just seemed natural that he would relate more to his mother, but now it was just the two of them now. His mother was gone. What happened, Dad? Katsuki asked and watched Masru stiffen immediately. And nothing happened, son, it was just a JJ joke. Katsuki stared at his father looking at him as if he'd spoken a different language. A joke, my mother, your wife was tortured and murdered as a joke, Katsuki shouted as his father shrunk away from him, his eyes shifting back and forth as if he was looking for an escape. Katsuki felt bad for yelling at his father in such a vulnerable state, but he couldn't believe what he'd just heard. His shout had been more shock than anger to be honest. Masru shriveled looking at his son. Aye, it's funny, right? Masru said chuckling a little as Katsuki looked at his father. She's just a real joker, you know, that's all. It's funny, right? Masaru shouted laughing louder as he grabbed his head, gripping his hair before pulling it out roughly as he laughed wildly. Dad, 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 Katsuki shouted grabbing his father's hands and holding them against his side as orderlies rushed in grabbing hold of Masaru and pushing Katsuki to the side as they restrained the laughing man as he kicked and thrashed. It's just a joke, right? It's all a joke. We should all be laughing. A doctor rushed in immediately injecting a sedative into Masaru's arm. The man continued to thrash wildly before slowly falling still and silent. She's a real jokerer. Were Masaru's last words before falling asleep. Katsuki looked at what was left of his father as his last words rolled through his head. Joker, Katsuki growled. Inko was sitting in the passenger seat of the ambulance, staring into the side mirror as Dagaba receded farther and farther away. I'm sorry I can't be there for you right now, Izuku, but I promise I'll be back and when I do I'll give you everything you want like I should have done all those years ago. I'm going to make you smile again." She said turning away from the mirror and closed her eyes. Ray heard her friend's words and smiled thinking about her reunion with her own son. I'm coming Shoto. It had taken a week, but finally Ray pulled into the large driveway of Endeavor's home. She hadn't thought of this place as her home in a very long time. The trip here was easier than she'd thought after all they were traveling in an ambulance from a city that was being ravaged by villains, it was only natural. She stepped out of the ambulance seeing that Inko hadn't exited the vehicle with her. Seeing this Inko waved her on. Go on without me, I don't want to be a third wheel, this is just for you and your son Ray. Inko said waving her towards the house as Ray smiled waving back and took a deep breath. Oh okay Ray you can do this. She whispered as she went to the front door and pulled it feeling it stand firm against her. She pulled it again and again before gripping the handle and channeling her cold into it feeling the metal grow cold until it shattered against her palm. She pushed the door open and saw that none of her children's shoes were there nor Endeavor's boots. She stepped forward slowly. H hello? She called out her voice echoing around the house. Ray slowly treaded inside looking around and seeing that all the furniture was gone as were the pictures. Ray's feet padded quickly in and out of every room looking and hoping that maybe just maybe there was still someone here. Fayumi, Natsua, Shoto, Taoya, Ray collapsed in the master bedroom. What was she doing Taoya had been gone for years. She looked at the empty room and then at the open closet and gasped with pain. There were her clothes all of them. For a split second she thought maybe Endeavor had kept them to remind him of her. But that thought shattered against the reality of who her husband is. He didn't keep them as some sentiment. It just wasn't worth the effort of throwing them out. She said walking up to the closet and ciphering through her clothes much like Inko had, and like Inko she found a remnant of her past. It was a blue jacket with white fur lining the collar and wrists. Ray remembered this jacket well she had bought it shortly after her wedding with Inji. She smiled at the memories of Inji before he turned into Endeavor. This jacket also carried the memory of the first time Endeavor hit her. She gripped the sleeves of the jacket as the memory played in her mind. Ray walked into the small home she and Engie had purchased together. This was early on in his career before Endeavor claimed the second place spot on the hero list. It was the middle of winter and Ray had been out shopping for their dinner that day and had spotted the jacket. It was an impulse by sure, but it looked so good she couldn't resist. Engie, I'm back. Ray spoke into the home finding Engie watching the news. It was another segment on All Might. Ray sat the groceries down in the kitchen before walking over to Inji's side kissing him on the cheek. Inji, look what I bought, she said holding the jacket out to him. Not now I'm watching this, was all her new husband said not even turning away from the screen as his eyes zeroed in on All Might. 
Ray wouldn't take that, though it really wasn't about the jacket, she just wanted her husband's attention. He'd been out almost every day late into the night, so much so she hadn't slept next to him in weeks. Oh, come on, Angie, just take a look. She said, waving it at his side again, and once more being ignored. Seeing this, Ray took it a step further, putting on the jacket, and standing in front of the TV as she showed it off. Don't you think it looks good on me? She asked, leaning forward right in Angie's face. What happened next shook Ray to her core. Angie jumped up. Damn it, move! He shouted, slapping Ray to the ground as he looked at her from where he stood. The anger there was instantly overcome by guilt and shock. Ray, I, I told you not now. Was the only apology Angie offered. I have to go, don't wait for me. He said simply as he left. Ray pulled herself from the floor as she cupped her face looking at the door after her husband's departure shaking slightly before crying. Ray gripped the coat tightly as the years of trauma flooded her. Why did she keep this? What was the point of keeping this tainted object? The pain, the fear, but most of all the anger at her weakness that she let Endeavor torture her and her children for so many years, and now he's taken them from her. No more, no more, no more, no more, no more she shouted snatching the coat and several other articles of clothing before taking off Inko's clothes. She didn't want to be warm now. No, she wanted to freeze not just her, but everything and everyone especially Endeavor. Ray walked out of her home seeing Inko having done a paint job on the ambulance painting it in white and green. It was horribly done, but no one would be able to identify it as an ambulance. Everything okay, Ray? Inko asked as Ray looked at her dressed in her blue furred coat and black skinny jeans with deep blue heels and a dark blue shirt. They're not here. Endeavor hid them from me. She hissed as Inko walked forward patting Ray on the shoulder. I'm sorry to hear that, but don't worry all we have to do is find all flame face and get him to cough up where they are and maybe a little blood too. I'm here for you, Ray. Ray shook her head. I don't want to be Ray Todoroki anymore. I want to be someone else, someone colder. Ray whispered as Inko rubbed her chin. How about Miss Freeze, or Lady Blizzard? No wait I got it. How about Killer Frost? Inko said with a giggle as Ray smiled. I like that, Killer Frost. She said her breath coming out with a puff of chill. Inko nodded happily clapping her hands. You know I've been thinking about this for a while. My son goes by Bane now I should change my name too. Inko said rubbing her face and smiling. I'll be Joker after all I'm going to be making people laugh. She said as she looked at Ray. Killer Frost nice to meet you I'm the Joker. Joker said holding her hand out to Killer Frost who eagerly shook it. Now if we're going to be going after the number one hero it's going to be tough. She said rubbing her chin before remembering something she'd heard on the radio. Apparently the city is being evacuated after what my dear Izuku did. Villains are running the city and you can bet your wedding ring that Endeavor's going to be there strutting his stuff as the number one hero. So why don't we have a chat with him? Joker said as she climbed into the ambulance. But Ray stayed where she was for the moment turning back to look at her former home and taking a deep breath before placing her hands on the ground and channeling her cold into it. A path of frost traveled from her towards the house after which spires of ice erupted from the roof. Inko clapped as she laughed. Now that's what I call extreme renovation she said laughing as Ray climbed into the car and the two sped off. Shoto looked at his older sister and brother as they walked into the new house their father had bought. It was a nice lavish home, only the best for the number one hero after all. Thinking that made Shoto physically sick. Knowing that his father was now the number one hero was vile. The only thing that made up for it was that Endeavor himself felt the same way. He didn't want the title this way. Now he'll never have the chance to beat All Might fair and square, for the rest of his days he'll know he was only picked as the number one hero because he simply happened to be in second place. That brought a grim smile to Shoto's face as he walked into his new room. The movers had done a great job, gathering all their things so quickly and setting them up in their new home. This is bullshit. We should be out looking for mom. Natsuo Todoroki shouted as he looked at the home his older sister and younger brother would be staying in. Natsuo just stop. It's not safe in Musutafu anymore and Dad said he'd handle it. Fayami told her younger brother doing her best to keep the house together like she always had. Yeah, right like he handled it before. You actually trust him to do anything for Mom after all these years, Fayami. You must be joking. Natsuo argued back as Shoto shut the door to his room to keep out their arguing. He'd learned that his mother was missing from the hospital and had been for over a week. Shoto didn't even know what to think honestly. He hadn't seen his mother in years. 
He'd wanted to when he was younger, but was told by his older siblings that mom was in a fragile place then and seeing what she'd done might cause her to snap completely. After that his father took up most of his time with training, or so he called it until Shoto refused to use his flames any longer. Now the thought of his mother brought nothing to him, and he felt guilty about that, but he had no time for it. There was a funeral he needed to attend. It was a solemn day at the Ida family cemetery. Today was the day of the brothers Ida's funeral. It had been decided that the brothers would be buried on the same day so as to be less painful for their family. Shoto stood with the rest of his class in a black suit matching the other boys while the girls wore black dresses. Mrs. Ida sat by the grave site, her face hidden by a black veil as her husband stood at her side, his hand on her shoulder as he put on a stoic face. The two caskets were brought forth, each emblazoned with the Ida family symbol, as well as Tensei's having the symbol of Ingenium. This isn't right, Kirishima said clenching his fists at Shoto's side. Why is all of this happening, he asked to no one. Shoto definitely didn't have the answer, but he gave his opinion to the former redhead. Bad things happen its life. We have to move forward nonetheless. That's what being a hero means. Kirishima looked at Shoto before shaking his head. If we're heroes, shouldn't we keep bad things from happening in the first place? Kirishima asked as he watched the twin coffins be lowered into their respective plots at the side of their grandfather's grave. After the funeral class, Wana met at a local diner, each thinking about the school year they'd had so far. I think I'm going to drop out of the hero course. Momo Yairazu said, shocking life back into the class. What, why? Mina asked only to hear a scoff. What do you mean, why? Haven't you seen the news All Might is dead? Yua has shut down and Musutafu is on life support as it is. You'd be crazy to want to still be a hero, Kaminari shouted as his words, though harsh, rang true. He's right, an entire city is dying at the hands of one maniac, who, by the way, is the same age as us. Minta agreed, slapping his hands on the table repeatedly. Being able to touch girls isn't worth my life. I'll stick to porn, it's safer. Minta finished. You're all cowards. Shoto said standing up as all eyes were on him. You don't deserve to be heroes if something like this will shake you. Easy for you to say, mister, I create glaciers like it's no big deal. The rest of us aren't so lucky, Kaminari said standing up and pointing at Todoroki who turned his back, not even bothering to respond as he left. I'm not going to say you guys are cowards, I understand your fear, but I can't stop. I want to be a hero, I need to be a hero. So good luck with your chosen paths, guys, it was fun being in the same class as you. Ochako said standing up and giving Momo a hug before leaving as well. The group began to disperse each with their own declaration of whether they were or weren't staying with the hero course until none remained. In a high-rise office a chair was thrown against the plexiglass window cracking it as it bounced off. A desk was flipped as papers were thrown into the air. It can't be, this isn't right, how could this happen, how could this happen? shouted none other than Naitai, former sidekick to All Might. He stood in the middle of the wreck he'd made of his office, broken furniture the guts of a shattered computer, and destroyed photos. I saw it. I saw when you would die, All Might, and it wasn't supposed to be there. It wasn't supposed to be at the hands of Bane. How? How did he change the future? Naitai asked himself before the door was thrown open. Naitai's bloodshot eyes looked through his glasses and the locks of his disheveled hair at his apprentice. Mirio. Naitai said standing a little taller as Mirio walked towards him. You want to know how this happened? It's simple really. It's because you didn't let me go to help him. This happened because you refused to act. This is your fault, sir. Mirio's words hit hard, not because he'd raised his voice, the exact opposite actually. Mirio's words were delivered in a calm and even tone, and like the blade of a scalpel they cut deep and precise. Naitai looked at Mirio as he felt his eyes burn with unshed tears. I know, it's my fault I should have gone, we should have gone, but I didn't act and now he's G-dead, so now I won't hesitate again. Mirio Bane was seriously injured in that fight, if we hurry we can kill him. Nightai said gripping Mirio's shoulders as light trickled into his eyes, but this wasn't the brilliant shine of heroism, no this was the flames of vengeance. Nightai wanted to kill Bane for killing All Might not because he wanted to exact justice. Mirio stepped back. We don't kill sir. I am going to take Bane in so he can face the punishment for his crimes. It is not our job to be judge, jury and executioner, you should know that. Mirio said looking at Naitai who glowered at his student. That's not good enough, Naitai shouted. 
He doesn't deserve to be coddled by the justice system, he killed All Might the symbol of peace. That is grounds for immediate death, no exceptions. It's his fault All Might is gone, and even if you take Bane in, he's already broken into a prison. How easy will it be for him to break out from one? He'll be seen as a symbol to all the other filth that follows him. They will come for him no matter where he goes. There is only one way to deal with him, and that is death. Now I'll ask you again, Mirio, will you help me kill Bane? Naitai asked, holding his hand out to Mirio, who turned his back on him. I will not, and don't I don't want to see you again, sir. If I do, I will take you down. This city deserves true heroes, and I will not have you tarnish the rest of us with your act of vengeance. I hereby quit the Naitai Agency. Thank you for everything, sir. Mirio said, walking towards the doorway and bowing before shutting the door and leaving Naitai in the darkened wreckage of his office and morality. Joker and Killer Frost sat on a nearby rooftop. The city looks so much better when there's nobody in it. Makes you feel like there's no one else in the world besides us. Joker said as Killer Frost stared at the sight of Yue and the undulating mass of villains that were approaching it. Wow that's a lot of bad guys. My baby is such a good leader. Joker said as she watched what she assumed was Izuku at the head of the army. Killer Frost stared at the front of Yue and even from this distance she could make out her husband's flames. She grit her teeth looking at him but kept her composure. Frost, not that I doubt you or anything, I just want to be sure I'm sure. So, um, how are you going to subdue that walking bonfire? Joker asked, drawing Killer Frost's eyes from her husband. I'm not a fighter, not like Endeavor, but nobody, and I mean nobody, knows Endeavor the way I do, and that's how I'll beat him, was Killer Frost's response. Joke nodded at her answer. Like I said, just making sure, I have faith in you, Frosty. Shall we go? Joker asked as Killer Frost nodded the two going down the side of the building via an ice slide created by Killer Frost. The two could hear the sounds of battle and see the explosions as they neared the battlefield keeping their eyes on Endeavor as he fought some kind of six-armed creature. The two moved back and forth across the city followed by blasts of energy and streams of flames before Endeavor launched the two of them all the way into the Yua building. Frost gripped her hair as her eyes went wide. No, 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 no. Frost screeched seeing her one and only chance of getting at her husband be snatched away. Joker looked at her compatriot wondering how they were going to get to flame face now. If all might was any evidence it was clear Izuku had no problem killing heroes, and with how Endeavor was he was a certified goner, or so she thought until a flaming rocket exited Yua. Frost look we need to go now, Joker shouted practically dragging Frost behind her as they made their way to where the flaming missile had landed. Endeavor looked at his wife taking notice of the clothes she was wearing. It wasn't something the recent Ray would wear. She was more for nondescript clothing plain even. Then there was her partner the woman was silent, but the grin on her face unnerved him. Her eyes seemed to dance with an intelligent, but insane light. Ray had never raised her voice to him, but now she looked at him as if she was about to kill him, and he wasn't in the best spot to stop her. He was nearly overheated from that fight with Bane's Namu not to mention it was two against one. Ray, you need to calm down, Endeavor shouted standing tall he was going to have to put his wife in her place again. Do you honestly think Shoto would let you anywhere near him? You nearly cost him his left eye, Ray, or do you not remember what you did to my son? He growled as Ray stared at him. You made me do that, it was your fault I, I never wanted to hurt Shoto, I just couldn't stand seeing you in him. Ray hissed as her gray eyes stared into Endeavor's blue ones. Those some eyes that had looked down on her as he hit her, the eyes that coldly watched her be taken away to the psychiatric wing. Ray, I won't ask again, calm down and come with me. You're sick and need more help than I thought. You killed a man, Ray. You're insane and a danger to others and yourself. Endeavor said as Ray glared at him, creating a blade of ice in her hand. I want my son. Was all Ray said as she rushed forward slashing with the sharp piece of ice. Endeavor narrowly avoided the slash. Ray wasn't a fighter never had been, so he wasn't too concerned with her antics as he reached forward to slap her. Somewhere in his mind he felt bad about striking his wife, but like the times before he reasoned that this is what she needed. To his surprise Ray nimbly dodged away from his blow and drove her icicle into his thigh. Endeavor grunted lashing out with a back fist into Ray's side, throwing her back as she slid across the rooftop. Endeavor gripped the blade in his palm, watching it burst into steam. I know how you fight Endeavor. All these years I've suffered your abuse, but I learned from it. What you look like when you're about to hit me. 
I know how to wait and watch for the openings you give. You train me just as much as you did Shoto. How does it feel endeavor to be on the receiving end of your spouse's abuse? Now you know how I felt all these years. You hit me, and when I was no longer useful to you, you threw me away. I'm not going to let you poison our son anymore. Give me Shoto. Killer Frost shouted her eyes glowing blue as she sent a stream of ice towards Endeavor. There was a reason that Endeavor chose Ray as his wife. He'd forgotten how truly powerful Ray's quirk was, but looking at the wave of ice in front of him reminded him. Endeavor stood up seeing the gravity of his situation. He was nearly overheated from his fight with that Namu, but he was Endeavor he would not let anyone stand against him let alone his insane wife. Flash fire fist jet burn. Endeavor called out before punching forward his fist erupting into fire and clashing with Ray's ice wave. The entire rooftop exploded into a pillar of steam as Endeavor crouched down gripping his arm. The sleeve of his costume was burned away revealing scorched flesh. Endeavor hissed looking at his arm. This was why he'd needed Ray to give him Shoto. His son would never have to worry about burning himself out like he and Talia had. He was perfect. Endeavor looked forward as Ray appeared before him in the steam. There were patches of frost across her body and face, showing that her power was taking its toll. You're nearly frozen stiff, Ray. What are you going to do? Endeavor said, struggling to rise and tower over his wife like he always had. Killer Frost smiled at her husband. Thank you, Endeavor, for tiring yourself out like this. You're right, of course, I'm nearly frozen myself. But with all the moisture in the air, I won't have to exert myself nearly as much now. It's easier to freeze water than air. She set her eyes glowing as Endeavor realized the position he was in and launched himself at his wife, but soon found himself in a massive pillar of ice, only his face remained untouched. His entire body was numb as his breath came out in clouds of mist. The door to the stairwell was thrown open breaking apart the crust of ice on it as Joker walked forward. Are you kids done here yet? It looks like things got steamy between you two. Joker said cackling as she stepped next to Killer Frost taking a look at her handiwork. I give it a 9 out of 10 you could have used better material. Joker said with a shrug. Now be a deer and tell Killer Frost where her darling boy is. Joker said patting the nearly frozen face of the number one hero. Endeavor glared at Joker. F fuck you. He growled his teeth chattering as Joker sighed. Okay looks like we have to do this the hard way. Guess I'll have to axe you again later. Joker said laughing as she pulled an axe from behind her. Can you believe they just have these things lying around in cases? She said shaking her head before slamming the head of the axe into the base of the pillar. Hold still now I wouldn't want to nick you by accident. Joker said as she continued to carve through the ice. Endeavor woke up his head felt heavy and thoughts were slow to form. It took him a moment to realize he was chained down pretty heavily with thick chains. He seemed to be in a classroom which made him think he might have been taken prisoner in Yua. He raised his head as his eyes began to focus and settled upon the figure of the Joker. He licked his lips before speaking. What have you done to my wife? He said as the feminine figure stepped forward. Oh, I haven't done anything all that credit lies at your feet, Mr. Endeavor. You caused all this. You know I've seen men like you in my psychiatric studies. Sure I'm not licensed, but you're a textbook narcissist. Everything is about you, and the things you surround yourself with are nothing more than adornments to drape yourself in. That's why you keep that stupid beard of yours lit all the time. You think it makes you look more masculine and intimidating. Just makes you look stupid in my professional opinion. Joker said standing behind Endeavor as she placed her hands on his shoulders, allowing him to get a good look at the scalpel she carried. You're a freak, and you've turned Ray into a maniac just like you, Endeavor shouted rattling the chains as he did his best to ignite his flames. But nothing came to him, not even the slightest spark. Awa oh, well, what's wrong can't get a spark out. It's nothing to be ashamed about though a lot of guys have problems performing. You might have some psychological trauma. Joker said putting emphasis on psychological. That statement alongside her previous one of having psychiatric training was enough to let Endeavor know she'd somehow fiddled with his mind to prevent him from activating his quirk. I won't tell you where Shoto is. I'd rather die than put my son in sight of you two psychopaths. Endeavor shouted as Joker began laughing. Oh, that's a good one. You have no idea how funny that is coming from you. You're just as crazy as us. Do you know the clinical definition of a psychopath? Joker asked and took Endeavor's glare and silence as a no. Here goes. Psychopathy is traditionally a personality disorder characterized by persistent antisocial behavior, impaired empathy and remorse, and bold, disinhibited, and egotistical traits.
sound familiar, like a man who never signs autographs or spends time with his kids instead preferring to spend the majority of his time with villains, a man who beat his wife and kids and never once offered an apology and then has the gall to think he can be the number one hero. So that's what three out of three. Looks like between all of us we've got three of a kind. Joker said laughing as Endeavor sat in his chair gritting his teeth. Sorry we're getting off topic. Now then where is Shoto Todoroki? Joker asked staring Endeavor in the face, only for the hero to lunge forward slamming his forehead against hers knocking her back. I'll burn both of you to a crisp you crazy bitches, shouted Endeavor as Joker rubbed her forehead smearing the blood from her split skin. All right then let's get right to it. I've got nowhere to be, and this middle school like the rest of the city is abandoned now. This is actually my son's middle school in case you were wonder. Joker said receding into the darkness only to return with a TV on a rolling cart. She turned the TV on presenting a screen of static. Endeavor looked at the screen before turning to Joker who stood there smiling. I know, I know the whole swirling screen is a lot more impressive. But hypnotism only requires flashing patterns and a static screen works just as well. Joker said before hearing Endeavor laugh out loud. You really are crazy. You think you can hypnotize me with a static screen. You might as well kill me now otherwise I'm going to die of boredom. Endeavor said laughing as Joker jerked his head back with her quirk, forcing him to stare at the screen before Endeavor shut his eyes. If it's so crazy why are you resisting? Just watch the screen and we'll see if I'm crazy or not. Joker whispered her breath against Endeavor's ear as he growled trying to shake her off before feeling a searing sensation in his eyelids as Joker proceeded to cut his eyelids off. Endeavor yelled out as he was forced to watch the screen. After several minutes into this Joker began to talk. Staring at static on TV will put you in the theta state. It's similar to when you're drifting off to sleep and makes us much more susceptible to outside influences. Joker explained letting go of Endeavor's head as he flopped forward slowly his eyes still on the screen. Now where is Shoto Todoroki? Joker asked. He's safe. Was the reply Endeavor gave. Joker frowned at this. You're still resisting I see. No matter this can go on for as long as you like. I may not be able to get you to answer my question just yet, but I can make you do other things. Joker said smiling. Can you smell that? It smells like meat on a barbecue don't you think? Joker said sniffing the air and sure enough Endeavor began smelling meat roasting over a fire. Something's off though it doesn't smell like pork or chicken kind or reminds me of beef, but different. Joker explained her green eyes arcing over to Endeavor with a smile. Oh now I get it, it's you, you're on fire. Your fleshing is bubbling and hissing as the flames lick away at it. Can't you feel it? Raw nerves exposed to intense heat, it must feel like the fire's right inside you hun. Endeavor grit his teeth as some part of his mind told him that this was all fake and illusion he had a fire quirk, there was no way he could burn so easily, but even with all that he could feel the flames she described. His body was on fire flesh being seared from the bone. Where is Shoto Todoroki? Joker asked again as Endeavor panted his forehead drenched in sweat as he fought the pain his mind was putting him through. The mind is really an ingenious thing you know. The right stimuli and a few key words is more than enough to allow the brain to create nightmares you can never escape from. Joker laughed as from Endeavor's perspective his eyeballs were being engulfed in flames sizzling and then bursting in his sockets. Ah! he yelled as Joker laughed. Endeavor's entire body was racked with pain. In what felt like hours he'd been burned alive, chopped into pieces, and right now he was slowly drowning without a single drop of water in sight. Man, you are tough as hell. I'm impressed. Now one more time with feeling. Where is Shoto Todoroki? Joker sing songed at Endeavor who after roughly coughing spoke. I, I enrolled him in Shikesu High School and purchased a house for him and Fayumi to live in that city. He said coughing harshly to remove the water in his lungs that wasn't there. Joker smiled happily before turning off the TV breaking the spell she'd had Endeavor under the effects from her drowning hallucination she'd put him under vanished, though the after effects remained. His lungs were sore and his skin was sensitive as if he had sunburn. You'll never get to him. Shikesu took a lesson from Yue and tightened security to the maximum the students are in dorms and never leave the campus unescorted. Endeavor rasped as Joker opened the door and stepped outside only for Killer Frost to step inside. You just let me worry about that. You and your wife have some catching up to do. Joker said leaving as Killer Frost shut the door and walked towards Endeavor the room growing colder and colder with each step she took. 
the two stood in front of one another staring into their eyes, seeing the parts of their son they hated the most. Get on with it, Ray. This is what you wanted, right? Me out of the way and Shoto all to yourself, so you can twist him until he's like you. Endeavor growled before coughing. Ray stared at Endeavor she'd never seen him so weak and beaten. It made her sick to think this creature could hurt her so much and dominate her life to such a horrifying extent. Killer Frost leaned forward until she was inches away from Endeavor. I'm stronger than you, Endeavor. She whispered before kissing him, her lips coated with frost, as the two kissed and ice began to spread from Endeavor's mouth to the rest of his body. His last sight was his wife with her eyes closed as she killed him. Principal Keshi of Shikesu High School sat in an interview room with several files on his desk. In these files were dossiers of the UA students who would be transferring into his school. As a parent, he felt so sorry for these children and all they'd been through. If he gave in to his parenting nature, he was liable to refuse their entry to his school, hoping to push them to a less dangerous path. But as an adult, he had to honor their resolve to continue studying to be heroes, which is why he was holding these interviews. He would need more than a simple school counselor. These children needed professional psychiatric help if they were going to overcome what happened. And as the principal, it was his job to give them that. He stood up going to the door seeing several prospects. We'll be starting interviews now. He said right before the door to the hallway burst open and a woman entered. She was dressed in a knee-length purple skirt and black heels. She wore a light purple blazer open to reveal a deep green blouse that matched her dark green hair. Her eyes were green as well, and she wore a radiant smile. I'm so sorry for being late. Please forgive me. She said bowing dropping some of her papers to which she kneeled down to pick them up. I'm such a klutz really I'm sorry, she said as the principal coughed. And you are? The principal asked as the woman smiled awkwardly. Oh, um, I'm Shiro Emi, nice to meet you. She said having gathered her papers and smiled at the principal. Keshi smiled back. And what a smile you have. Take a seat, we'll be with you shortly. He said as he waved in the first psychiatrist. Principal Keshi sat down behind his desk as his last interviewee sat across from him. He pulled her file open and flipped through the pages. You said your name was Shiro Emi and you've studied psychiatry but didn't get your license until recently? Keshi asked noticing how Shiro slowly spun her ring around her finger. Yes, that is correct. I passed my licensing years ago, but never saw a need to practice so I let it expire. But with everything that has been happening, I felt I needed to do something so I filed for a renewal and was waiting for my license in the mail when Camino happened. She said bowing her head a little as she sped up her ring turning slightly. I see, and you're married? Keshi asked drawing attention to her ring as Shiro nodded with a sad smile. Yes, my husband and I were married for fifteen years. Keshi noticed the past tense in her sentence. I don't want to assume the worst, but is your husband? He could see tears building in her eyes and reached for a box of tissues before handing it to her. I'm sorry, but I have to know. I want my students to be in good hands so I need to know more than strictly necessary for my staff. He explained as Shiro nodded her head, dabbing at her eyes. Don't apologize, I understand. But to answer your question, yes, my husband died in the Camino Ward incident. I had never intended to practice my psychiatry. My husband was the breadwinner. But with him gone and having to move out of the city, I needed a new way to support myself, and I thought of nothing better than to offer my services to those poor children. Keshi nodded finding himself drawn to her ring spinning on her slender finger. That's quite big of you Miss Emmy, and I can't say for certain yet, but I think you are a very good option for our psychiatrist position. Of course this will be pending a background check which shouldn't take long given your history. Keshi stood up and offered his hand to Miss Emmy who shook it gratefully. I look forward to working with you Principal Keshi. Shiro said smiling as she was escorted off campus, she happened to pass by a group of girls, seemingly new students, as they drugged their luggage after them. Shiro gave a big smile as she looked back at the guard who had a glazed look in his eyes. Okay, give me the files you found, Shiro said as the guard handed over a stack of folders held together by a rubber band. Thank you, she said patting the man on the cheek. Don't be so serious, smile, she said before walking away hearing the guard slowly begin to laugh. Shiro made her way to the parking lot and slid into a car in which sat Killer Frost behind the steering wheel. How'd it go? She asked as the woman known as Shiro Emi slowly began to transform back into the Joker. Her cheery disposition was slowly wiped away with the makeup that had hid her pale skin. 
Pieces of prosthetic skin much like what was used in the movies was peeled away from the sides of Joker's mouth, revealing the scars. I'd say it went great, I think the principal really likes me, and I'm a shoe in for the job. Even now my darling Izuku is helping me. It's hard for anyone to verify who you are when the city you're from is being held by a madman, or so they think. Joker explained gritting her teeth at the things people were calling her son. But put that aside to peruse the folders of the kids she'd be counseling in the near future. Of course looking through them for Shoto Todoroki's file and soon found it. Says here he's in the male dorm alpha, of course he is. Your son looks like a real alpha male. Joker said looking at the photo of Shoto before perusing what was written in his file. Quirk half cold half hot. Jeez you'd think they'd come up with a more unique name for the it. She thought to herself. Shoto displays a very antisocial exterior in his time in Yua, he hardly spoke to any of his classmates. His grades are above average, but his quirk is leagues above any other child his age, which I suspect may lead to a superiority complex. No fucking da his dad was the walking personification of ego and pride. Joker shook her head gleaning a few more things from the file before looking at Killer Frost. There's an address I assume that's the home Endeavor bought for Shoto and your daughter Fayumi right? Joker asked not having committed the name to memory yet. Killer Frost nodded thinking of her oldest daughter. Fayumi is such a sweet girl. She was the first to come visit me in the hospital and the one who visited most often. Natsuo came every so often, but Shoto never did. Fayumi would show me pictures of him over the years. He started to look so much like Endeavor. Killer Frost spoke the steering wheel gaining a light coat of frost. Um, hey KF, how many kids do you have? There's Fayumi Wright. And of course Shoto, then you just mentioned Natsuo, Joker said in order to pull Killer Frost back from freezing their wheel and crashing their car. Killer Frost thought for a moment pulling her mind back from the rage she felt boiling under her skin. She'd killed Endeavor, but even still he'd marked her with this unquenchable rage she'd never get rid of. There's Fayumi, my oldest daughter, then Natsuo, and finally Shoto. She said as something scratched at the back of her mind trying to remind her about something. Toya, my oldest child, but he's gone now. She said, but wasn't really sure what she'd meant by that. She said he was gone, but not dead she knew that. Killer Frost shook her head. What's the address? She asked as Joker looked at the paper again and read out the address. But I don't want to intrude on your family fun time, so just drop me off in downtown, there's an errand I need to run. Joker explained, and with a nod Killer Frost turned down another street. Fayumi sat in the living room of her and Shoto's new home. It was even grander than the last one in her opinion, a physical sign of her father's rise to power. She sighed as she set her cup down and then her younger brothers across from her. You don't have to check up on Natsuo. I'm fine even without Shoto or dad here. She said as Natsuo took his cup sipping at the tea. Yeah well just because Shoto is in school doesn't give dad a reason not to check that his only daughter is alright. If you hadn't noticed Fayumi villains are less afraid of heroes than they've ever been. All Might died and as much as dad tries, as many criminals as he puts away he won't be the symbol of peace. He's the number one in name only. Natsuo said as Fayumi sighed. I wish you wouldn't be so negative Natsuo things are bad enough as it is. I don't need your pessimism on top of that. I know you hate dad and Shoto hates him but I am trying to keep us from falling apart. We already lost mom and Toya. Natsuo shook his head. Look, I'm sorry, Fayumi, it's just. At that moment, there was a knock at the door. Fayumi stood up and walked to the door before giving out a scream which jolted Natsuo to his feet. What is it, Fayumi? He shouted, gathering ice in his hand. Natsuo rounded the corner, and as soon as he laid eyes on who was at the door, his ice broke apart in his hand. There stood Rei Todoroki with a gentle smile as she looked at two of her oldest children. Hello, Fayumi, Natsuo, said Rei as she walked into the new house to embrace her children. That was right, they were her children and Dever hadn't wanted Fayumi, nor Natsuo not once she'd given birth to Shoto. Mom, shouted the two siblings as they held their mom close with Fayumi bursting into tears as she nuzzled her mother. Natsuo's eyes brimmed with tears as well as the trio of ice users sat in the living room. Mom, I can't believe this, we've been looking for you for weeks. Fayumi shouted looking her mother over not seeing any bruises or wounds. Yeah, where have you been? We've been worried sick. Natsuo shouted not noticing how his mother clenched her fist. Where have you been? Natsuo asked as Rei took a breath. I've been doing some thinking about things, and I decided that I'm better now. 
I don't need to be in the hospital anymore. Fayumi and Natsuo looked at one another for a moment at Ray's statement. Well that's good mom, but don't you think you should have told a doctor or something you were leaving? Fayumi said as Ray looked at her. If I did that your father would have been told and that I don't want to see him again. She said holding a hand to her mouth to cover the smile as she thought of Endeavor's frozen face. Alive anyway. She said as Fayumi cast her eye to her brother who nodded. Ah uh, mom we're glad to have you back in everything but we were told that you killed someone. Natsuo said, causing Ray to start. I did, but only because he was going to stop me from leaving. I had to kill him, but he's in a better place now anyway. Ray said, waving her hand at the thought of the man. Mom, that's terrible you killed someone, shouted Fayumi before Natsuo grabbed his sister and held a hand to her mouth. Don't pay attention to Fayumi, Mom, she's just a little shocked is all. Why don't you sit right there and fire me, and I will make you some tea and get some rice crackers to celebrate you coming home. Natsuo said dragging his sister into the kitchen. Natsuo, what do you think you're doing? Fayumi hissed. Mom just admitted she killed somebody, and she doesn't seem to regret it at all. Something it obviously wrong. I think Mom may be worse than before. Fayumi whispered as Natsuo looked at her. I know, I know. Obviously mom is sicker than before maybe something happened while she was away from the hospital or she's been without her meds for too long. Either way we need to keep her calm until we can get her to a hospital. There was a crackling sound and the sister and brother looked back to see their mother standing there her hand producing a chilling mist. So that's how it is. I was hoping that maybe since you two were older that Endeavor hadn't gotten to you and turned you against me. You want to lock me away again just like your father did. Killer Frost screeched as her two children looked at her. No mom that's not it. We just think you might be a little sick after not having your medicine for so long is all. We just want to make sure that you're okay. Natsuo said as he slowly approached his mother. We love you and are happy to have you here. Natsuo explained as Killer Frost looked at him. You know your father did a lot to me, but he never lied to me. She shouted her hand rushing forward as ice collected in her palm, creating a jagged icicle in it before said icicle disappeared into Natsuo's abdomen. You're tainted by your father, you're not my children anymore. She whispered as Natsuo clutched his mother's arm and turned to his sister blood running from his mouth. Fayumi run, he gurgled as he turned to his mother. I'm sorry we couldn't save you. He said before sending ice down his mother's blood-stained hands, freezing his life fluid and keeping his mother stuck to him as his dimming eyes stared at her. The things he wanted to say, the things he should have done to help her but didn't. He spent most of his life hating his father for what he'd done to his mother and little brother. But in the end what had that amounted to? He'd left home and started living his own life. Sure he visited his mother as often as he could, but was that helping her? No it hadn't he couldn't remember the last time he'd spoken to let alone seen Shoto. This would be the end for him, but he would not let his sister die. She was the one who'd stayed and put up with their father, and protected Shoto for all these years. She deserved to live. Fayumi looked at her brother dying at the hands of their mother, and she wanted to scream and run to him, to stop this from happening. But if she did that she'd be throwing away her brother's sacrifice. So with a heavy heart she turned and ran to the front door. Killer Frost jerked her hands against her son's frozen blood and glared at him. I don't want your apology, she shouted kicking Natsuo's corpse from her hands freezing her hands and taking in her son's blood creating a frozen blood blade as she turned stomping her foot as ice rushed down the hall after Fayumi creating a wall to block off the front door which Fayumi crashed into falling to the ground. Mom please don't do this we just wanted to help you. Fayumi said getting to her feet as her mother advanced on her her eyes glowing blue in the darkened hallway. Don't call me mom, you're not my child, you're Endeavor's daughter, you're stained with his sin. She said raising the blade above her head only to be blasted with cold from Fayumi's hands. Fayumi never trained with her quirk much like Natsuo hadn't they weren't what their father wanted and after seeing what he was neither child wanted to pursue the path of the hero, so her quirk was incredibly weak. Killer Frost slid back a few feet before beginning to power through her daughter's last ditch attempt. Your power came from me. You're nothing but a pale copy. This is what your quirk should be like. She hissed as she sent spikes of ice through the floor pinning Fayumi through the arms and legs. The girl screamed as her blood traveled down the spikes. Mom please stop. I'm your daughter. I visited you every day in the hospital. I showed you pictures of Shoto growing up. I love you. 
Fayumi shouted before being impaled through the chest by the frozen blood of her brother. Killer Frost has only one child. She hissed letting go of the blade as Fayumi's head dropped against her chest. Detective Tsukachi rubbed his eyes as he sat at home reviewing the Bakugu case for the millionth time he was sure. The torture and murder of Mitsuki Bakugu and the rape of her husband all of it felt so personal like the person had a serious axe to grind more so with Mitsuki than her husband, it would seem. He looked through the statements and for the most part it seemed an even split. Everyone either liked or hated Mitsuki, but he didn't have all the pieces he needed. The evacuation of Musutafu City threw a lot of agencies into disorder, he was sure he was missing many a key detail. The only thing that stood out was a recent altercation Mitsuki got into with a woman known as Inko Midoriya, but she was taken into custody and put into the psychiatric ward of a hospital. He was unlikely to get any word from the hospital, what with the evacuation and the murder of one of their doctors. Masru Bakugu was another dead and the man was broken, and who knew how long it would take to put him back together, and he couldn't locate Katsuki. He'd spent a few nights with his father and then suddenly disappeared. Tsukachi was worried about the boy, he wasn't sure if he was still in Musutafu or not, and that city was the last place he should be. Tsukachi sighed standing up from his desk as he turned off the light in his study as he went into the living room. I need a break. He said grabbing a soda from the fridge and sitting in his recliner as he turned on the TV flipping over to the news. It was a commercial about some dishwashing liquid before the news started and Tsukachi knew something was off. Instead of its usual logo, there was a Joker playing card on screen, which was then torn away revealing the dead bodies of the news crew arranged before the anchor's desk in a curve reminiscent of a smile before the camera turned to the two news anchors that were bound to their chairs, then someone a woman it looked like walked into frame. She had lime green hair under a wide-brimmed purple straw hat, brilliant red lips that stretched into an elongated smile by the scars at the sides of her mouth. She wore a purple suit and gloves as she stood between the bound anchors. Hello Japan nice to meet you finally, you may ask who I am, and I'm here to tell you that I am the Joker," she said throwing off the straw hat to reveal herself fully to all her audience. Sorry about the green screen I couldn't get it to work and broke it I think. She said slapping the screen behind her instead of showing a background, it was simply a wall of static. The reason I'm here is I wanted to introduce myself to the world. Now some of you may be aware of my work, but for those of you who aren't let me show you she said grabbing a large aerosol can. Now this is the part where I should tell you that this will contain graphic scenes of violence and gore, but we all know you sadistic bastards are going to keep watching anyway so why bother? Oops forgot to mention the harsh language. She said before sitting on the desk between the two anchors that at seeing the gas began to writhe with tears coming out of the female anchor's eyes. SHHH, 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 it'll be okay just smile. She whispered tearing off the tape from the female anchor's mouth as the woman began to scream and jerk before Joker sprayed her in the face for a few seconds. The neon green gas slowly dissipated from around the woman's head as she coughed and hacked tears streaming from her eyes as if she'd been maced, but slowly her coughs changed to soft laughter that slowly rose in intensity. The woman laughed hard barely able to catch her breath as her body jerked and spasmed. The blood vessels in her eyes burst as tears of blood ran down her face as the laughter stopped in an instant, the woman's head flopping to the side as her dead smile graced the screen. This ladies and gentlemen is my Joker gas patent pending. I'm going to put a smile on this city's face until every last one of you is laughing. Joker said the last words being spoken in a low growl. I'll be seeing all of you soon she said before turning to the male anchor and tearing off his tape before shoving the entire spray can into his mouth and hopping off the desk and walking off screen. The last thing anyone would see is the male anchor succumbing to his poisoning. Tsukachi stared at the screen watching the death throes of the man as his phone rang repeatedly. He'd felt fear before it was part of the job really, but nothing before had made him feel this cold pit in his stomach as if he'd stared right at the devil herself. If Bane is the king of villains, she has to be the queen of evil. Tsukachi whispered. Shiro Emi looked at her new office in Shiksu High School and smiled. She was in, and it had been easier than she'd thought now she could get to Shoto. After what happened with Frost's other children, she decided to prevent the same thing from happening to Shoto after all a mother killing her children was a tragic thing and Shoto was the apple of Frost's eye. So being the good friend she was Joker wanted to help her friend. She looked at the number of students on her docket today. Let's see the UA students I will be looking after today are Shiozaki Ibarra, 
and after a bit of wheedling Shoto Todoroki. She said looking through Shiozaki's file. Plant hair, hun? Hope she's not too thorny. She said snickering some as she heard her door open Shiro grabbed her nearest pen and turned around ready to drive it through her intruder's eye. But instead she found a brown-haired girl with expressive brown eyes. Like excuse me Miss Emmy? The girl said wearing Shikesu's uniform complete with a hat. Shiro adopted a grin as she relaxed. Gotta get a hang on my murderous tendencies, she thought to herself. Yes, that's me, and how can I help you? Shiro said offering a gentle smile as the girl grinned back. I'm Kami Utsushimi, and I know you're like for the U.S. students, but I was hoping I could like talk with you. The other guidance counselor totally doesn't get me, you know. She said rubbing her arm. Shiro's mind was ringing like a firehouse bell at all the signs this girl was giving off. She was practically begging to be read like a book. The arm rubbing was a coping mechanism in a vulnerable situation. The use of the word like she was trying to be likable displaying an upbeat persona. You're being bullied, aren't you? Shiro said it was a statement, not a question the signs were all there. Kami looked at the counselor, her eyes dimming before lighting back up. What no you're like totally off base, Miss Emmy. Nobody is bullying me. Kami said smiling as Shiro stepped forward shutting the door. You're lying I can tell Kami. You can be honest with me, I promise nothing will leave this office unless you want it to. She said as she guided the girl to a couch, and she sat herself in a chair after retrieving the young girl a drink. There are different kinds of bullying Kami for instance underestimating your abilities or calling out indecent behavior. Shiro said seeing Kami's hands tighten around the mug at the examples she gave as if trying to strangle her drink. Bingo, Shiro thought as she leaned forward. Of course you don't have to say anything Kami if you just want to stay here that's fine, but I do have some other students to meet with today, but you're welcome to stay until then. Shiro said standing up before hearing Kami speak. Some people think I'm dumb and that I don't take things seriously enough as a Shikesu student, but I do. I'm like totally psyched about being here and wanting to be a hero. Just because I don't walk around with a stick up my ass doesn't mean I don't know what it means to be here. She shouted before covering her mouth as she looked at Miss Emmy. I'm like really sorry about that Miss Emmy. Kami said bowing her head and hearing the woman move to sit next to her. Don't worry about it Kami. That's why I'm here so you can let it all out. This is your time to be yourself. If you don't mind my asking what is your quirk, she asked as Kami sat up a little straighter. Oh my quirk it's called glamour, I can make illusions with my smoke. She said breathing out a pink mist and creating a small cat with it. Shiro smiled wide almost peeling up the prosthetics at the sides of her mouth. That's amazing think of all the things you could do with that. Shiro said as her own mind twisted and turned at the possibilities. It was official she wanted this girl. So let me get this straight your classmates don't think you're serious about being a hero. Well how can they be so sure about that? Is it the girls that say these things? She asked as Kami nodded. Yeah most of the girls and some of the guys, the girls think I'm a slut. Some of them have tried to keep me from going to the provisional license exams. I mean just because I'm friends with a lot of guys doesn't mean I'm sleeping with them. And what if you are does that matter? Shiro asked as Kami looked at her. Kami, you are a pretty young woman if you decide to pursue that kind of relationship with guys that is between you, them and nobody else. If they think your quirk isn't qualified to be a hero, show them that it is, and how much of a nightmare you can make your dream be for them. Shiro said placing a hand on her shoulder. Kami, my next appointment should be arriving soon, so we'll have to cut this off here, but if you ever want to talk again don't hesitate to come see me. She said as the younger girl stood up cleaning her face of tear marks before smiling at Miss Emmy. Thank you so much Miss Emmy, I'll be back again. She said as she left unable to see the predatory grin on Joker's face. Well, well, well this school is just full of diamonds in the rough. I'm going to have a lot of fun here. She said as there was a knock at the door allowing her to replace her facade as Shiro. Come in. She said looking at the girl who entered the room. My day just keeps getting better what a beautiful flower she thought to herself as she sat down. Hello, my name is Shiozaki Ibarra. It's a pleasure to meet you. She said as she shut the door and walked forward. Shiro looked at Ibarra taking notice of her most striking feature, the waist-length green vines sprouting from her head, though Shiro noticed how towards the end her vines were beginning to yellow. The pleasure is all mine, Ibarra. My name is Shiro Emi. I'll be your counselor in hopes of smoothing your transition to Shikesu High School. Shiro said as Ibarra took a seat across from her. 
Now just to set some ground rules I borrow, whatever you say here is between the two of us, no one outside this room will ever hear what you say, unless you decide to let them know. I know you've experienced some harrowing things in a very short time, and I want to let you know I am at your service Shiro, whatever you're feeling or going through, I will help you so feel free to speak your mind without worry. Shiozaki took a deep breath and Joker could see the cracks in her mind. She could already tell that Ibarra was a sensitive soul. So these events struck at her core, and on some level Inko's motherly instincts were screaming to console the girl. But from that point of origin to her consciousness Joker's madness, turned that need to comfort into a twisted desire to manipulate. Yes I have it's been a rough first year to say the least. I hope that the Ustch incident was only set on class, a which I know is a terrible thought. But then things kept happening our internships were cancelled. Then our training camp was attacked, and that poor Ida boy was killed. It's all been too much. Shiozaki said clasping her hands together as if in prayer as she started to cry. Joker bit the inside of her cheek as she watched the ramifications of her son's actions. Oh Izuku, I wish you could see this. You poor girl I feel for you, I really do. Shiro said pushing a box of tissues towards the girl. It's a lot for one girl to take, but I have to admit how proud I am that you still decided to pursue your path as a hero. What a strong girl you are Shiozaki. What is the secret to your strength? Shiro asked watching Ibarra smile a little and knew she'd press the right button. It's my faith really. I don't think I'd be able to do this without it. I know that God doesn't give us any more than we can handle and that if I persevere through this, I will find the path he wants for me, which I believe is as a hero. I may be experiencing terrible things right now, but if I give in to this obstacle imagine the terrible things people will have to go through and won't have me there to help them through it. Joker wanted to yawn at this religious rhetoric, she'd have to break her of that if she was going to use her. That's really impressive Shiozaki, I have met very few people as devout as you. Shiro said her mind twisting and turning as to how to break this girl. Shiozaki, what are your thoughts on Bane? Shiro asked watching the girl shiver some at the name. What do you mean? She asked as Shiro pressed. It's simple really what do you think of the man who caused so much pain, killed a student at your school? chased you from your city, and now owns your school. What do you think of him? Shiro pressed as Ibarra began sweating. He's a villain I, I don't like him. Ibarra said as Miss Emmy sat back. That's it you don't like him? He has your city in the palm of his hand Shiozaki, and all you can say is that you don't like him. Don't you feel angry? Miss Emmy asked as Ibarra nodded. Yes, I suppose I do. You suppose, don't you want him gone? Don't you want him to be punished? Shiro asked. It's not my place to say such things. Only God can truly judge and punish us. Was Shiozaki's response. Really, but you want to be a hero, right? Isn't it your job to apprehend villains? Aren't you passing judgment on them? I, I mean, I guess, but I'm just capturing them, not determining their punishment. Shiozaki couldn't understand why Miss Emmy was doing this. Wasn't she supposed to help her adjust? So you're saying that if Bane was here right now, you wouldn't do anything? You wouldn't attack him or anything. Ibarra, don't you care about Musutafu? Shiro asked, causing Ibarra to jerk. Of course I do. I pray every night for the people stuck in that city. I'm sure you do. But that's not enough, Ibarra. Right now those people are in hell, and all you can say is you're praying for them. Well, a lot of help, that is. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me what you would do if Bane was here right now. Shiro shouted as Ibarra jumped up. I'd kill him with everything I had. I'd strangle him with my vines and lash the flesh from his bones and curse his rotten soul to the deepest pits of hell. Is that what you wanted to hear? Shiozaki shouted her body, heaving as she stared at the psychiatrist. Shiro stood up and looked at Shiozaki before hugging the young girl. I'm sorry, Ibarra, but I had to do that in order to see how you truly felt. It's my job to make sure you students aren't harboring destructive tendencies, and if you are, I'm to work to try and rid you of them. Ibarra looked at Shiro and felt tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what came over me. I'm just so angry. Are you going to tell the principal? She asked worried she may not be able to continue working towards her dream. I have to give the principal my findings, but no, I won't tell him what happened here. This is just our first session. I'm confident that I can help you. So take my advice, Shiozaki. Faith is a good thing. I really believe that, but maybe put some more of that faith in you. After all, God helps those who help themselves. Don't be afraid of your anger. If something is bothering, you let people know. Don't hide it. It'll be good for you. And your hair, I mean, look what holding in all that anger has done to your lovely hair. 
Shiro said lifting up some of Shiazaki's yellowed vines. That's my professional opinion, and I'll check in with you soon. Shiro said brushing some of the vines out of Ibarra's face as the girl nodded wiping her face as she left. Woo, she's a tough one that whole religion thing is going to be quite the hurdle, but I'm sure I'll get her to come around. She said kneading her hands in excitement. Shiro went over to her desk pouring herself a glass of water as she waited for her last appointment of the day to come in. The man of the hour Shoto Todoroki. The door opened revealing the two-toned face of Shoto Todoroki. Joker could see his father in him immediately. His frustration and anger of having to be here were palpable. He sat down without saying a word and cast an eye towards her as if sizing up a bug before squashing it. Hello my name is Shiro Emi nice to meet you. Shiro said smiling at Shoto. Why am I here? Shoto asked bluntly. Shiro leaned back thinking how best to answer that. Isn't it obvious? You need help Todoroki. Shiro said and received an icy glare from the boy that reminded her of his mother. I don't need help. I'm fine can I go now? Shoto asked his voice calm, but unable to hide the hint of malice in it. I'm sure you think you are, but some wounds cut deeper than you might know. Tell me Shoto how did you get that scar? Shiro had expected Shoto to bristle at the question, but instead seemed to wither. That's none of your business. He said simply the anger gone and instead a solemn tone replaced it. Joker smiled she knew an opening when she saw one. A boy needs his mother and Shoto obviously needed his. Shoto can I be honest with you? Shiro asked as Shoto looked up at her questioningly. Sure. He responded as Shiro set her clipboard down. I know how you got your scar, I know your mother gave it to you. Shiro said shocking Shoto and Shiro capitalized on it. I've spoken with your mother before. I was a volunteer at the hospital she was in. She always talked about her youngest son, how much she missed him and wanted to see him, but most of all how sorry she was for hurting him. She'd burst into tears thinking of you and how you must hate her. I could never hate her, Shoto shouted getting to his feet and looking at Shiro. I don't blame her for what happened that day. I blame him, Shoto growled sitting down and clenching his fists. I assume you mean your father? Shiro asked as Shoto gave a solemn nod. Yes, your mother mentioned her husband once or twice. I'm guessing you know she's missing, correct? Shiro asked as Shoto nodded once again. I came here because I care for your mother, I want to see her safe. And I know how much she wants to see you, so I'm sure she'll come here soon. Joker smiled at the light that began shining in Shoto's eyes. I want to help her, and I want to help you too, Shoto, if you give me the chance. Shiro said holding out her hand as Shoto looked at the woman before shaking her hand. You're free to go, or if you want we can just stay here and talk. Shiro said as Shoto sat there for a moment before looking at Shiro. Could you tell me more about my mother please? Shoto asked and Shiro smiled wide. I'd be happy to. She said smiling as she began to tell Shoto all she knew of his mother. Of course the vast majority was lies or half-truths, but she was confident that she could pull them off besides she'd already accomplished her goal. Shoto trusted her, and as the boy left that day Shiro smiled wide laughing quietly. She'd come here looking for Shoto, but now she had three toys to play with and mold. Life really is like a box of chocolates. She said smiling as she packed up for the day. Joker looked at the three pictures in her room. She and Frost had started inhabiting a house after the previous owners moved on. The thought brought a smile to her face as she looked at the pictures of Shoto, Kami, and Ibarra, her three pet projects. Over the past few weeks she had begun picking them apart within their sessions, exploiting their mental weaknesses and applying steady pressure until they'd crack. Kami was easy enough to convince the girl it was better to be feared than liked. It had all started with a fight Joker had instigated between Kami and the girls around the school. It had only taken a partial rumor she'd mentioned about Kami dating another girl's boyfriend to another teacher in earshot of a female student and then watched it spread like wildfire. The girls had retaliated and Kami had no choice, but to use her quirk on them subjecting them to horrifying images. This of course had cost Kami her participation in the provisional license exam and Kami was furious about it. Of course she was there as Shiro to comfort the girl as she mourned her lost chance. Ibarra was a bit harder to manipulate, she was far too absorbed in her religion, but slowly she'd drawn the girl away from that pulling her to do things for herself and embrace that wrath she held deep inside pestering the girl within their sessions, leaving her nerves frayed and constantly irritable. Then there was Shoto the person she had assumed would be the hardest to manipulate. 
but really he'd been the easiest, stoking the fire of hatred he already held for his father, and then endearing his mother to him more and more driving him to want to please her. And now she was in the final stages of her plan. Tonight's the night, she said standing up and coming out of the room she was in and walked past the one locked room in the house and into the leaving room. She saw Frost sitting there staring blankly at the TV. You've been really patient, Frost, thanks for that, and now your patience will be rewarded. I'm going to get your son and a couple other kids for us to take care of. Joker said as Frost's eyes glistened with unshed joyful tears. Thank you, Joker, she said as Joker smiled. Careful, or you'll freeze your eyeballs with all those tears, she said with a laugh as she left to the school. It was simple to go in, she had the clearance she needed to get in, and then it was a short trip to the female dorms where she encountered the guard. Who goes there? The guard shouted as Joker stepped out her grin wide as she spoke. Slapstick. Upon hearing that word the guard stiffened and then relaxed his eyes glazed over. Go and get Kami Atsushimi and Shiozaki Ibarra. They are not to be killed, but if anyone gets in your way do kill them just make it quiet. Joker hissed as the man smiled wide as possible and walked into the female dorm. It hadn't been hard to hypnotize and plant post-hypnotic suggestions in the guards around the school. All she had to do was strike up a lengthy conversation with them. And seeing how boring their jobs were they were welcome for any kind of distractions after that all she had to do was hypnotize them and plant the key word in their minds. In this case slapstick and they'd enter the hypnotized state and do her bidding. As much as she'd like to wait here for her girls to be delivered to her, she had to go to the male dorms. She had a thought that Shoto might be a problem in capturing him, and seeing as how he was the main objective, it was better she'd take a more hands-on approach. Shoto lie in his bed asleep until he heard the sound of his room door being opened. He lay there fully awake, but pretending to be asleep as a figure moved towards him. He slowly clenched his fist as the figure neared him, and once they reached for him, he turned flinging his blanket in their face before freezing it to them and watching them fall to the ground wriggling. Shoto panted as he took off from his room, he rounded a corner as he heard footsteps rushing quietly behind him. He grit his teeth as he ran down the halls. He needed to alert the dorm attendant about this. Obviously, he was the only target otherwise his pursuer would have gone after someone else while he went to alert someone. He hurried down the stairs towards the dorm attendant's room pounding on the door, only for it to fall open under his fist, and lying there on the floor was the dorm attendant their neck snapped as their sightless eyes looked at him. Shoto felt a presence behind him and turned ready to unleash his ice, only to find Shiro Emi there. Miss Emi? he asked as the woman nodded. He couldn't be absolutely sure it was her, what with the lack of light in the darkened hallway, but the green hair was a definite giveaway. Yes, Shoto, oh my god, I'm so glad you're safe, she said grabbing his hand. Come with me, we have to hurry, she said tugging him along towards the front door, and as he followed her, he noticed the body of one of the school guards at the bottom of the stairs. It looked like he'd been pushed down the stairs. What happened to him? Shoto said as Shiro threw open the front door. I had no choice, Shoto. All the guards are being controlled. I don't know how or by who, but they seem to be after you. She said as the two ran into the night. Wait, shouldn't we call someone or warn the other students? This could be an attack by Bane Miss Emmy. Shoto shouted tugging back against Shiro's grip, only for the woman to fall against him as he felt electricity rocket through his body dropping him to the ground as he stared up at Shiro only for her to crouch close to him revealing her true face. Scars and all. Nighty night Shoto. Joker said stroking his hair as the young boy fell unconscious. Joker stood back up looking at the two other guards she'd compromised. Grab him and put him with the others, then go have a blast she said as the two guards nodded and grabbed Shoto, bringing him to a van that Joker had stolen to get here, tossing him in the back alongside the unconscious Shiozaki and Kami. Joker climbed into the driver's seat as she then sped off, watching the two guards disappear from her rearview mirror, only for an explosion to sound off soon after as Joker laughed wildly into the night. Shoto slowly opened his eyes. His head was pounding as he slowly regained consciousness. He looked up slowly before feeling a cool palm on his cheek, he started jerking back from the touch as he looked around frantically. SHH, SHH, it's all right, Shoto, it's me, I'm here, said an all too familiar voice. Shoto's mismatched eyes looked up at his mother, who wore a matronly smile as she stroked his hair. Hi, Shoto, she whispered as she crouched down to meet him eye to eye. It's so good to see you, she said, smiling as she then kissed his forehead. 
Mother Dubby, what are you doing here? Where am I? He asked as Ray cupped his face staring at him as if committing every detail to memory. I see so much of your father in you, but I see me too. It's okay, Shoto, I can get rid of your father's mark. She said standing up and grabbing a kettle that had been sitting behind her with steam slowly wafting from it. Shoto's mind ran back to that day all those years ago and he started to thrash in his chair. Mom, mom stop, he shouted as he watched her grab the kettle and bring it over. It's okay Shoto, it won't hurt this time. She whispered as she placed a hand right beneath his burned scar, began to freeze it slowly numbing it until Shoto could feel nothing, and then she grabbed hold of his face and tilted it up against Shoto's attempt to resist as he was forced to stare at the kettle slowly being tipped toward him. Close your eye Shoto, it'll be over soon. Killer Frost said smiling. Outside the door Joker could barely hold her giggling in as she stared at Kami and Ibarra. Well, while Frost and Shoto get requainted, why don't the three of us start as well? Joker said as she turned on the screen behind her and produced two syringes with several vials to go with them. Miss Emmy, please don't do this. Why you're my friend right? Kami asked as Joker turned to her and smiled. Of course I am Kami, and that's why I want to free you from the chains of sanity. Sanity is what kept you from killing those girls who bullied you. Sanity is what made you scared to be yourself, but no more. You can be the real you. Joker said approaching as she drew the plunger back on one of her syringes drawing in the liquid from one of the vials, and then drove the syringe into Kami's neck. What was that? What did you do? Kami shouted as Ibarra began crying next to her as slowly Kami began to convulse and out of her mouth spilled smoke. Oh boy, I didn't expect that. Joker said as she put on a gas mask and then turned to Ibarra. Your turn, Rosebud. Joker said before plunging a syringe into Ibarra's neck as well. The girl convulsed in her chair before her hair began to grow longer and fuller, but also began to traverse under her skin and through her body seemingly wrapping and coiling around her innards as Joker watched the two's transformations. And as they say the rest is history. Joker said flopping back on the couch next to Bane having finished her story looking at Bane as she poured herself a glass of water. Feel free to applaud at any time. I went through a lot to get to you Izuku. It hurts my feelings that you aren't proud of me. She said as Bane sat there drinking it all in before standing. I've heard your story and why believe. I believe you. But one question what was in those syringes you gave them? He asked turning to her. Oh that's easy it was trigger. You wouldn't believe how easy it is to get things like that when you're me. After the whole new studio thing I had no trouble finding people giving me things. A lot of them thought I was working for you as some kind of expanse outside of Musutafu, and other people just wanted to get their stuff out there. They say that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Joker said smiling as Bane nodded before speaking. Welcome mother. He said which split Joker's face with a grin as she launched herself at him hugging him as hard as she could. Not surprised she couldn't fit her arms all the way around him. That's all I ever wanted, Izuku. She whispered as she backed away looking at her boy. What do you say we destroy Japan? She said as Izuku walked away from her towards the door. I don't destroy things, Joker. I break them. When people are broken, they'll look for any way to fix themselves. He said opening the door that lead to a conference room. In said room sat all of Bane's warlords muscular, Dabai, Twice, Killer Croc, Leech, and Mr. Compress. Bane took the seat at the head of the table as his followers looked on. My warlords you have stood by me since the beginning. With you I took this city, but now there is an entire country who wants us gone, who threatens the kingdom we built, and to that all I can say is war. Bane shouted his voice shaking the ceiling. They think they can threaten us, make us scared. To them war is their last resort to us war is our only resort. Conflict, violence, death, all these things are known and embraced by us so to war we will go. That's all well and good Bane, but shouldn't we make our bed before leaving? We still have no idea who killed Spinner, and can you honestly let something like that go unanswered? Dabai asked his blue eyes settling on Bane who nodded. Dabai was dressed in black and blue shoes with black pants, a short-sleeved shirt under a deep blue hoodie. Of course not. Spinner was a loyal soldier and his death will be avenged. I leave that in your capable hands, Dabai. Seek out Spinner's killer and see he pays for what he's done. And to that end take twice and Mr. Compress. Dabai gave a nod satisfied with Bane's response. Boss, why the hell is the clown here? You can't be expecting us to work with this crackpot. She's crazier than Moonfish and that's saying something. 
Muscular growled glaring at the woman sitting in Toga's seat. Muscular sat in his chair in spiked boots, black and gray camo cargo pants, and a black muscle shirt. As much as I dislike agreeing with him, the meathead has a point. Her actions don't align with Stain's doctrine or yours for that matter. Killing indiscriminately is not the mark of someone we should work with. Dabai explained. Bane cast an eye at Joker only to find her showing off a completely calm exterior, the small smirk on her face not having diminished at all. Does anyone else have reason to object to my partnering with Joker? Bane asked as there was a cough from Mr. Compress. If I may be so bold, Bane, this isn't so much an objection, but an inquiry why do you wish to partner with the Joker? True, she has a flair for the dramatic, but lacks your talent for stage craft. Compress explained as Bane sat back. To answer your question, Mr. Compress, her flair for the dramatic is the exact reason I want her. I inspire fear by my strength, breaking the bodies of heroes, but Joker has broken their minds. All of Japan sees me as a symbol to be taken down, but they fear the Joker because they have no idea what she is and that's what I need. I'm not asking you to trust or even like her, but you will respect my decision to use the tools at my disposal, is that understood? Bane asked as his lieutenants nodded in agreement. Good now as things stand Joker will be given control of the territory overhaul commanded. Dabai, you will be given charge of Spinner's territory keep any weeds from sprouting. As for the rest of you prepare to move. In the next few days we will open the gates of hell and my demons will spill out over Japan prepare yourselves for the carnage to come. Dismissed. Bane ordered as everyone got up to leave. Bane stood up retreating his office as Joker rose from her chair dusting herself off and straightening her suit only for a palm to slap on the table in front of her. You may think you're getting your way, but don't for a second think I'll let you do anything to the boss. I'll wring your fucking neck if I even think you're planning something you got that bitch. Muscular growled only for Joker to smile wide. I'm so glad Bane has such a loyal guard dog, but let me make one thing clear. If you ever call me that again I'll cut out your other eye and make you eat it. Joker hissed drawing her knife across Muscular's fingers before flipping it up her sleeve and leaving. Hey, has anyone seen Toga? Twice asked as Dabai shrugged. No, but if she's not next to Bane, I can only assume she's playing with her toys again. Dabai said shaking his head as he left with the others. In Tokyo in the top room of a high-rise building sat a conference of all the current top heroes. The number one hero being Hawks who sat at the right of the Prime Minister of Japan. This is horrifying. You're telling me a boy has done all this? The Prime Minister asked looking at a picture of Bane, and then a school picture prior to his transformation. Hard to believe I know. Kids these days just grow up way too fast. Hawks said drawing the eye of everyone there. How can you joke about this? This kid killed All Might, and now that he's been provoked he's planning to rampage across Japan. Rukyu growled, not being able to believe this kid was the number one hero even Endeavor was better than this. What are our options? asked Tiger Leader of the Pussycats as Pixie Bob stood next to him. An all-out attack on Musutafu will result in a lot of casualties, but it would be a lot better than having this war take place across all of Japan. You'd be sacrificing the people in that city, though can you live with that tiger? Can any of us? Edshot countered staring at the gathered heroes. You're all missing a crucial point here, we're not just fighting Bane. We'll be taking on the Joker you all heard what Miss Joke said and saw the aftermath of what happened when they invaded Overhaul's base. Bane is a grand threat all on his own, but with that madwoman on his side makes this a whole different ballgame. We don't even know who she is. Gang Orca shouted as the room fell silent. That's not entirely true. Spoke someone from a corner. The heroes turned ready for action, not having noticed the person standing there until they walked forward revealing themselves to be none other than Detective Tsukachi. The man seemed to have age much in this year. His black hair have grayed at the temples and a five o'clock shadow present on his chin. He wore his traditional trench coat with a wrinkled shirt and pants. Everyone this is Detective Tsukachi, he's been working the Joker case since its infancy, we brought him in to tell us what he knows. The Prime Minister said waving the detective over as Tsukachi grabbed a large box and brought it over dropping it on the table before fishing out file after file. This is everything I've compiled on Joker. I know that she was a patient at Musatafu General's psychiatric ward before the murder of a doctor allowed her to escape with her partner in crime killer Frost, who after doing some digging I found to be Rei Todoroki, the wife of the hero Endeavor. 
At this there was a gasp as the heroes and proper officials looked at pictures of Ray. I went through any brutal crimes that happened during the time of this breakout, the best known one being the murder of Mitsuki Bakugu and the rape and torture of her husband. I thought this might have been Joker's first crime I was wrong. Mere blocks away there was arson in an apartment complex, there was only one victim a male by the name of Hisashi Midoriya. Now why would Joker have killed these two people? At the name Midoriya, the heroes thought of Bane. Are you telling us this man is Bane's father? Edshot asked as Tsukachi nodded. Yes, but back to my question. Hisashi worked abroad, there was no way he could have possibly known Mitsuki, except he did, through one person, his wife Inko Midoriya. Tsukachi pulled a picture from his jacket showing a doughy woman with green hair bearing a striking resemblance to Bane. Their mother and son, shouted Gang Orca looking at the two photos. Yes, Inko Midoriya is the Joker. After finding this out, I did research on her. Izuku disappeared which drove Inko into a deep depression, which resulted in a psychotic break that forced her husband to commit her. She broke out and killed her husband probably in revenge for his betrayal of locking her up. The murder of Mitsuki was just as personal. I spoke with her son while on a visit with All Might prior to this incident. Bakugu admitted to bullying Izuku for being quirkless, as any parent Inko must have harbored anger for the boy. I found out the incident to bring about her committal was an altercation with Mitsuki. Tsukachi explained feeling a grand sense of relief. Finally, he had the entire puzzle put together after more than a year of tracking down leads. I believe that Inko went to the Bakugu house that night to murder Katsuki, but he was in Kamino that night, so unable to do what she came there for she attacked his parents. This whole thing has been to get back to her son. She loves Izuku more than anything having him gone broke her, so now her entire existence hinges on Bane. That's well and good Tsukachi. But how does that help us now? What is knowing any of this going to do? Hawks asked leaning forward as Tsukachi coughed. We drive a wedge between them. Joker is dependent on Bane's approval and need of her. But we all know Bane prides himself on his strength. I say we introduce a spy into their midst someone that can upstage the Joker. If Joker believes she's being replaced, she'll act rashly anything to prove her worthiness to her son. And that will be our chance to strike. Tsukachi said as the room dwelled on the detective's words. Naitai looked at the cameras he'd placed around Yue and other places throughout the city and slammed his fist down. So the two have joined forces, have they? He said leaning back in his chair. That's good, it just means our targets are all in one place. Bakugu said as he fashioned more bullets for his guns. I'm going to hack Bane's legs out from under him. Bakugu said looking at the three villains on the camera and smiling. Time for a hunt. Dabai walked out of the main building of Yua with Twice and Mr. Compress. Oh yeah boys night out fellas, let's go wild out there. Twice said as Mr. Compress shook his head. You seem to misunderstand what we're doing twice. This is a mission we're to find Spinner's killer and bring him to hell. We can't let our comrade's death go unavenged or to let someone so publicly mar Bane's regime. Mr. Compress explained as Twice rubbed his chin. Yeah, well, it's been a while since we've been together, let's make a day of this. Twice rebuffed. Shut up. Dabai instructed as he stopped near the main gates of UA as he saw two people standing there. Hello, Toya. Killer Frost said walking up to Dabai. Are you going out? I'd like to come with you. I mean, we'd like to come with you. She said waving to Shoto whose scarred visage stared at Dabai. No way, this is for Bane's guys only. Move along, Miss Freeze, or whatever your name is. Twice shouted as Shoto turned toward him and raised his hand flames gathering in his palm as Dabai stepped forward. Twice shut up. You and Compress go see what you can find out about anyone who had it in for Spinner. I'm sure the list is long. I'll go my own way. Dabai instructed turning his eyes to the two before Mr. Compress bowed. As you wish come along twice. Mr. Compress said snatching twice by his mask and leading him off. Keep him under control Killer Frost. If he does something stupid to piss Bane off, I won't protect either of you. Dabai said as Killer Frost frowned. I'm your mother Toya and Shoto is your brother. You should be with us. Frost hissed as Dabai stared her down. You think the fact we share blood makes our bond any stronger than the others I have? You seem to have forgotten the life I lived before now. He said walking past the two of them only to hear footsteps following behind him. I know what happened to you Toya and I killed Endeavor for it. He's dead Toya I did that for all he's done. 
Killer Frost said, walking up to Toya. I know what he did, and I'm sorry I couldn't do anything then. I don't want your apologies, Dabai shouted blue flames sparking up his arm as Shoto jumped in front of Killer Frost. Don't yell at my mother. Shoto growled flames crawling up his left side as ice ran down his right. Dabai smirked looking at Shoto. You know I owe you a thank you Shoto Todoroki. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to get away. You became Endeavor's punching bag instead of me. Dabai said before walking away only for one set of footsteps to follow after him. Toya wait. Every time she called him that it scraped across his mind like a rusty knife. Toya you're still not trying, shouted Endeavor slapping his son to the ground. You have to build your flames hotter. I know you can, so stop acting like a little sissy and just do it, shouted Endeavor wrenching Toya to his feet. Build your fire just like me. Endeavor instructed as his own flames began to build growing larger and hotter the longer he did. Sorry, Dad. Toya said, wiping the blood from his nose as he began building his fire, the flames going from red to orange to yellow, and finally blue. Toya looked up from his hands to see his dad smiling at him. That's what he wanted. That's all he wanted from his father. His approval, that's why his dad hit him. It was to make him stronger so he could do things that nobody else could. His dad was training him to be the next All Might. Good Toya, very good, Endeavor said eagerly. Toya smiled himself before he caught the scent of something burning. He looked down to his hands to see the skin on them blistering and charring, and then the pain struck. Ah, Toya shouted as he fell to his knees looking at his burned hands, and then up at his father seeing that proud grin gone, and nothing but a disapproving frown. It wasn't until at the hospital that Toya learned what was wrong with him. Your son just doesn't have the constitution you do, sir. His body doesn't produce enough of the flame-resistant chemicals as you do, which is in direct contrast to the sheer power of his flames. Toya sat in the hospital bed as he stared at his bandaged hands. His father had remained silent throughout the doctor's explanation. Th, thank you, doctor, Ray said as the doctor left. The moment after the door shut, Endeavor launched to his feet and turned on Ray. This is your fault. Your frailty has ruined him for me. He's a failure, Endeavor shouted at Ray. Don't say that in front of him, Ray shouted before Inji slapped her to the ground similar to how he'd done Toya just the other day. Dad, stop, Toya shouted, gaining his father's attention. You have no right to tell me to stop, boy. You're a failure. I have no use for you. Inji said as he reached for Ray. Come on, Ray, we'll have to start again. Inji said as he pulled Ray to her feet and headed for the door, leaving Toya alone in the hospital room. Dabai jerked as someone ran into him before hurrying down the street. Stop, Dabai commanded as the person did so and turned around. It was an older man in his thirties or so with blonde hair, glasses, around his yellow eyes and dressed in a dirty sweater impossible to tell the color of along with sweats and ragged boots. I'll have my wallet back, thank you. Dabai asked his charred hand outstretched. The man snickered. Yeah, I don't see that happening, Scarface. The man said before nearly being impaled by an ice spike. That wasn't a request. Killer Frost said grabbing hold of the man and starting to freeze his throat. All right, all right here, he shouted producing the wallet from his coat pocket. Dabai walked forward and took hold of his wallet. He looked at Killer Frost. This wasn't the Ray Todoroki he once knew. His mother had been a gentle and quiet woman, but this woman before him was almost the opposite. She was calm, but that only intensified her cruelty. Do you know who I am? Dabai asked as the man looked at him. You're just some guy like the rest of us criminals here feeding off of Bane's underbelly. Should I know who you are? He asked only for Frost to increase her grip. I'm Dabai one of Bane's men. He said as the man's eyes widened. Look man, I'm sorry I didn't know. If I knew you were with him, I would have never taken your wallet. The man said. I know. But you've been here a while probably so you might know a few things. What's your quirk? Dabai asked as the man smiled. I have a knack for knowing what people want, and you want information. Go ahead ask away, I'll tell you what I know free of charge. Consider it an apology for before, and hey maybe you can put in a word with the big man for me? Dabai placed his hand on his mother's and she released her grip. Tell me what you know about Spinner's death and we'll see. Dabai said as the man rubbed his neck. Spinner the lizard, right? Guy who ran the south part of town. Yeah, I heard he'd been taken out, but it's really nothing new. The guy's been killing the lot of us left and right every night. 
Dabai's eyes widened at this. The guy, you know who killed Spinner? Dabai asked not wanting to believe it could have been this easy. The blonde-haired man looked at Dabai confused. You really don't know, he kills several of us every night. The man growled as Dabai stared him down. Bane doesn't keep track of anyone who isn't a threat, and those that he does deem threatening aren't around very long, so again tell me what you know. The blonde man sighed. I don't know much, none of us do. He shows up on that damn bike from hell screeching like a banshee. He shows up and puts people down permanently. If anyone killed your spinner it was him, blast lung. Dabai stepped back and looked at his mother. Let's meet up with twice and Mr. Compress Bane needs to know about this. Glad to be of service Mr. Dabai. The man said shaking Dabai's hand and staring him in the eye. Hope to be seeing you and the big man again real soon he said before rushing off. Dabai looked after the man before rushing off to find twice and compress right as a god-awful roar could be heard in the distance. Bane stepped forth out of a portal and into a lab followed by Joker. Thanks for the ride, Smokey, Joker giggled as Kirijiri formed behind the two. What are you planning on doing here, Bane? And with her? Kirijiri asked, ignoring Joker, as Bane walked down a hall. If I'm going to fight a war, Kirijiri, I need soldiers. Bane said thrusting open the doors, and as the lights turned on revealed dozens of vats each with a Namu inside. You can't be serious you remember what happened the last time we activated one of these things, we had to put it down. These creatures can't be controlled without Dr. Ujiko, and last I checked you had Leech kill him. Bane growled at Kirijiri's words. That was a miscalculation on my part. I underestimated the doctor's usefulness, but that's where Joker comes in. He said turning to Joker who smiled at her son. Just being next to him brought her a peace she couldn't live without. You've rewired the minds of three aspiring heroes as well as mentally tortured Endeavor. You have the ability to turn these creatures from double-edged swords to super soldiers. Joker looked from Izuku to the monsters in the various tubes and smiled. Whatever you want Bane, I'll do it for you. She said walking up to one Namu in particular, it seemed to have a hood of skin over its head and exposed muscle fibers. This one, I choose this one, Joker said clapping as she placed her hand on the glass of its container. Him I think I'll call you Red Hood, she said smiling as she looked at the creature. Bane nodded. Kirijiri see that Joker has everything she needs and bring her up to speed on what we know so far. Bane said as Kirijiri looked at the woman making kissing faces at the monster before looking at Bane. As if sensing Kirijiri's question Bane spoke again. If you're so worried keep an eye on her, just don't let your guard down, now send me to Gigantamasha. I need to talk to him. Bane instructed as Kirijiri nodded. As you wish, he said opening a portal and watched Bane walk through. He turned around having Joker right in his face. He stumbled back and fell to the ground as he looked at the manic woman. So smoky it's just you and me now, why don't you show me around? She said smiling as she held out her hand to which Kirijiri grabbed, feeling a shock run through him as he yanked his hand free. Oh sorry about that forgot I had it on. She said smiling before walking to the large computer as Kirijiri shook his hand before following her. Bane walked out of the portal and into a wide wasteland. The buildings in this part of the city had been demolished and shifted to the perimeter making a wall of rubble, and sitting atop it was Gigantamasia, a massive creature right out of a nightmare with stone-like patches of skin and tusk-like teeth protruding from either side of his jaw with spiky hair trailing down his back and wearing armor similar to Bane's. Bane climbed the wall of rubble before standing beside the creature as both looked out over the rest of Japan. Master. Gigantamasia said turning to Bane as Bane turned to him. Gigantamasia, I have need of you, Bane said as Gigantamasia stood up. Whatever you want, master, the beast said staring down at the striking figure before him remembering the day they met, and he witnessed Bane's true strength. Gigantamasia had been listening to his radio in the deep woods of Japan as the device delivered soul-shattering news to him. He had been listening to the fight between his master and the hero All Might, but then the tide turned and his master was killed by someone called Bane. Gigantamasia clenched his fists and raised them high about to destroy the tiny radio, but he couldn't this was the last thing he'd received from his master. Unable to vent his rage physically he roared into the night frightening animals and people alike for miles. All for one AE. 
Gigantomatia had spent weeks in a haze from that point on mindlessly wandering the woods as he relived his master's death over and over tears streaming from his eyes as he walked until he caught a scent. He knew every creature within miles of him, this scent was new, and there were more, but the initial scent was familiar to him. He turned inhaling deeply as he pinpointed his target and rushed forward kicking up dust and pulling trees up from the ground with his passing. It's Kyrgyri, he said excitedly maybe he was here to tell him that what he'd heard on the radio was a lie, that his master wasn't dead. Gigantomatia focused his senses in the direction he was heading eager to catch sight of Kyrgyri, but as he listened he heard snippets of a conversation. Brought us to the backwoods. Here I swear. Traitor kill him bane. Gigantomatia's eyes widened at that name, he just heard his white-hot rage bubbled in his chest, propelling him from the tree line and landing in a quarry in front of several individuals. A blonde man was gripping Kyrgyri by his neck as Gigantomatia roared. Bayan! A green-haired man turned to him and looked him over. Gigantomatia could smell no fear or anxiety from him. This man was not at all shocked at the sight of him, this man was Bane. Well done, Kyrgyri, I never doubted you. Muscular release him. Bane ordered as Muscular dropped the shadowy individual as he stared at the monster before him along with the other members of Bane's crew. Wow look at him Bane, he's kind of cute in a grind your bones to make his bread kind of way. Himiko said hanging on to Bane's neck from behind. All I see is someone powerful. He said undoing Toga's arms from his neck before walking forward. You're right monster I am Bane, what do they call you? Bane asked before Gigantomatia brought his fist down on him, slamming him into the ground. You killed all for one, shouted Gigantomatia as Muscular, Killer Croc, Leech, and Toga looked on in shock before anger took over. Boss, shouted Muscular before covering himself in muscle fibers and leaping towards Gigantomatia, slamming his fists towards his head. Rash, hissed Killer Croc barreling forward and sinking his teeth into Gigantomatia's leg. You fucked up hard ugly shouted Leech leaping forward and grabbing hold of the arm that had punched their boss into the ground and began sucking the strength from the beast. But even after maxing out his quirk, he couldn't move Gigantomatia's fist. Gigantomatia roared at Croc's bite before kicking him away and grabbing Muscular's entire body with one hand and palming him into the ground before swiping that hand across the ground and swatting Leech away to slam into the side of a bulldozer. Kyrgyri looked on seeing the three toughest members of Bane's team be taken out in seconds. Kyrgyri looked to his side and gritted his teeth at the look on Toga's face. Her normally bright yellow eyes had dimmed to a dark osher, and to his shock Toga's sclear had gone blood red as she walked forward with her knife poised and a vial of blood in her hand which she took the top off of as she approached the monster. Gigantomatia turned to the girl and raised his fist above his head before bringing it down only for it to be stopped feet above Toga's head the wind forcing her hair to wave and flail as Bane placed a hand on Toga's. That blood is only for special circumstances Toga, and this is not one of them. He said, pushing Gigantomatia's fist to the side and tore off the remains of his shirt. I see you're in need of some discipline. Bane said, cracking his knuckles and reaching into his pocket and slapped two patches one on each shoulder. The drug flowed through his body, enlarging the villain by a foot, and his muscles bulged with unrestrained strength. Don't you know who I am? I am the man who broke all might. Bane shouted as he leapt up and slammed his fist into Gigantomatia's forehead, knocking the villain back as Bane gripped a lock of Gigantomatia's hair and repeatedly drove his fist into the creature's face before being slapped off of his face to land on the ground near two mining cars. Gigantomatia rose from his prone position blood running down his face as the wounds Bane dealt began to heal. I'll kill you, shouted Gigantomatia before a mining car flew into his face, driving chunks of stone into his eyes. Egg! The beast roared scratching at his eyes before hearing something at his foot, he lifted his leg narrowly avoiding a punch to his kneecap from Bane. Gigantomatia slammed his hand down only to feel it be gripped and stopped midair as Bane twisted his fingers breaking them as he pulled Gigantomatia to the ground. Kyrgyri looked on at the devastating battle before him. Do, do you think he can win? Kyrgyri asked only to be answered by Toga who'd calmed down and sat next to Kyrgyri. Don't be stupid of course he will. Nobody can beat Bane, she said drawing her knees up to her chest to sit her chin on them. Besides, if he doesn't I'll make sure nobody will find out. She threatened as Kirajiri swallowed watching the fight go on. It continued for days neither Gigantomatia nor Bane stopping until the very end. 
Bane slammed another jagged piece of metal through Gigantamacia's leg, pinning the beast to the ground as Bane stood in front of the giant monster his body covered in blood, as he panted before stepping on Gigantamacia's head. I beat your master, I beat all might, and now I've beaten you. Now who do you serve? Bane growled, increasing the pressure on the beast's skull. Gigantamacia stared up at Bane and growled. Don't make me kill you, I need someone like you. Fiercely loyal serve me Gigantamacia and I'll make you more than a frail old man's bodyguard. You'll be my weapon to crush this world. Swear to serve me." Gigantamacia continued to stare up at Bane as tears fell from his eyes. He was so happy someone like his master was still here a true king. A king must inspire dread, must be admired and must be strong. I will serve you Bane. I serve you with all I am Bane. What do you want from me? Gigantamacia asked Bane in the present as the former smiled. Roar, my friend, sound the bell of the end times, and when I give the order, open the gates. He said as Gigantamacia smiled before taking a deep breath filling his lungs to the brim before releasing a deafening roar that shook dust from the rumble and echoed in the chests of everyone who could hear it. Bane stood next to Gigantamacia, and all he could do was laugh. Bane turned away from Gigantamacia with a final pat to the giant's leg before sliding down the hill of rubble and beginning the trek back to his castle. He could of course call Kyrgyri to simply warp him there, but he enjoyed walking through his kingdom. His lieutenants thought it was a bad idea especially Himiko, but he'd refused to concede on this point, he relished the opportunity too much. When he'd first taken over Musutafu and went for these walks droves of criminals would come for his head wanting to be the next top dog, and he would welcome all challengers with bloody fists and a smile. But as time went on the challengers grew fewer and fewer, until now no one would even dare look in his direction. This would not do. Bane was a creature of conflict and violence, he thrived on it. And so did his companions. He remembered something he'd heard years ago from a professor on the nature of good and evil. If left unchecked evil will feed on itself until it dies. He would not let that happen standing at the top of villains wasn't the end for him. No, he would stand at the top of everything and everyone. Bane looked up as he reached the gates of Yua and smiled. Time to go beyond, plus ultra. He said as his phone began buzzing in his pocket. Bane pulled it out seeing a picture of a pair of fangs on the screen and smiled. Hello Himiko. He said hearing a purr on the other end of the phone as he entered the main building of Yua. Hey Bani, she squealed in his ear. Are you missing me? she asked as Bane chuckled. Every second. How are things going? he asked. Oh fine same all, same all getting kind of boring actually, I haven't spilled any blood in what feels like forever what about you? She asked as Bane entered his office and stared at the person sitting in his chair. Things just took a turn. He said as Poison Ivy drew her bare feet slowly from the top of his desk as she stood up. Ivy was dressed in her vines as usual spiraling around her abdomen and coiling down her arms and legs sprouting flowers at her breasts and crotch. The flowers changed seemingly day to day. This time she wore brilliant red roses as she sauntered up to him. Hello, Bane, she said in husky voice as she coiled around him like amorous Japanese wisteria. Toga heard the voice and her teeth clicked together audibly. Bane, who is that? She hissed in his ear as Bane disengaged from Ivy. Ivy, what are you doing here? He asked, ignoring Hamiko's question as the green girl moved closer to him again. Joker said when she's gone to take care of you, so here I am to care for every inch of you just like I do my garden. She said drawing a hand down from her chest to her navel. Toga gripped the phone angrily. Bane, what is she doing there? Why is she in your office? What are you doing with her? Bane sighed at this. Ivy had opened a powder keg just now, and he only wanted to deal with one fire at a time. Himiko calmed down Ivy, his following Joker's orders a little too well, that's all. I'll call you back later. He said hanging up as he glared at Ivy. Get out. He commanded walking past her as he heard her bare feet pad after him. Awa, did I get the missus angry at me? She teased sitting on Bane's desk as he sat in his chair. Where is she anyway? Ivy asked as Bane's green eyes stared at her. Ooh, what a stare you have. A girl could get used to that kind of look. She said leaning forward her face inches from his. How about a kiss handsome, it'll be our little secret. She whispered before Bane grabbed her by the neck and stood up pushing her against the wall. Listen to me. I will crush your skull in my hand and toss your body out in the streets if you ever. Bane? A small voice called out gaining both of their attention. Eerie stood in the doorway her small hand clutching the frame. 
she wore a black and white dress with a spade on the left of her chest and emblazoned with an A. Bane looked from Eerie to Ivy before dropping the ladder. Leave. He commanded as Ivy got to her feet stroking her neck. So rough, but I like it. She said walking out the door her hips swaying as she ruffled Eerie's silver hair. Eerie did you come here by yourself? Bane asked as Eerie smiled walking into the office. Yep, all by myself. She said proud of this fact as she climbed into the chair in front of the desk that Bane leaned against. You're becoming independent, that's good. You never know when you'll be on your own. He said running a hand through his steadily growing green hair. He might have to call Compress back in. The man always gave a great haircut. I don't want to be on my own. I know you and Mama J will protect me. She said in childlike innocence completely unaware that she was in the presence of the most dangerous man in Japan. Bane could almost smile at her naivete, if not for the fact she had spoken something truly disgusting. The world doesn't give a damn what you want, Iris. There may come a time when you have to fend for yourself, and when that time comes if you're not ready there are people out there who will break you and use you until there's nothing left. He growled before standing up. Come with me, Iri. He said walking out of the office, hearing Iri's shoes hit the ground and click after him. The two made their way outside to the Yua grounds, and once their bane kneeled in front of Eri placing both his hands up palm out towards the girl. Come at me, Eri. Bane commanded as the little girl fiddled with her fingers. You want me to hit you? She asked as her heart feuded heavily in her chest. I want you to try. Was Bane's response as Eri slowly raised her fist over her head. Inwardly Bane cringed at the absolute ridiculous stance Eri had before bringing her fist down only for Bane to slap her fist to the side. Oh, Eri whined clutching her hand and looking at Bane. Do it again. He said seeing a spark of anger in Eri's eyes and smiled. Glad to see the girl wasn't without her fangs. She raised her first again practically throwing it at Bane's hand only to have it slapped aside again. Ouch why are you doing that? She shouted as Bane retook his stance. Again. He said as Eerie punched at him and once again her hand was slapped to the side. Stop it, she shouted punching as he slapped her hand. Make me. He said as Eerie attacked him again and was rebuffed. I said stop. She shouted her horn glowing and growing again as she slammed her fist towards Bane. But unlike previously Bane sensed something different and instead rolled to the side seeing Eerie's hands slam onto the ground and a pulse branch out from the impact as the grass under her disappeared and a large Sakura tree began to cycle through its seasons until it began showering them with its leaves. Bane swallowed as he looked at the little girl wiping her face of tears. This was Bane's first time seeing Eerie's quirk in action, and he was frightened by the ability, because he couldn't understand what happened. Did she reverse time on the tree, or maybe just destroyed the grass? Is it limited to what she touches, or can she do it from a distance? As Bane thought about this, he heard the sniffling of the little girl before him. Putting his thoughts aside for the moment, he sat down in front of the crying airy. Why are you being mean to me? She fumed staring at him, her crimson eyes boring into him with their innocent confusion. I'm making you stronger, girl. You are weak, that is a fact. But whether you stay weak is on you. If you stay the way you are now, there will only be two options for you in life to be protected like with Joker, and when that protection fails to be used like Overhaul did, that is your reality as of now. I refuse to protect someone who can't do the same for me, Eri. You need to decide are you going to be a victim or the victor. He said standing up and heading for the door back into the main building before feeling a tug on his pant leg. I don't want to be hurt anymore. Can you teach me to be like you? Eri asked looking up at Bane who smirked. Yes I can, and when I'm done you'll be my ace in the hole he said turning around. The old man who spoke with Dabai walked down an alleyway to a dumpster before pushing it to the side and sliding behind it before replacing the dumpster and locking it in place. He began walking down a hall in which he discarded the ragged clothes revealing a worn suit and tore off the wig revealing his blonde and green hair transforming into the former pro Nighteye. Nighteye walked up to a bank of computers and reached for a communicator and turned it on. Bakugu where are you? Night I asked before hearing Bakugu's voice. He's just walking around like there's no threat to him. I could do it, right here and now. Bakugu said as he watched Bane from the third floor window of a nearby building. He'd been patrolling through here looking for any rats to pick off when suddenly Bane appeared through a warp gate. Katsuki had been shocked seeing him there so close he could do it just blast his brains out from where he was and everything would be over. 
Bakugu, don't be stupid. Do you honestly think Bane is out and about with no protection? I guarantee you this is nothing more than a trick to get us to reveal our hand. It's probably that Toga woman. Bane is not aware of our existence, so if he's out alone, then it's a ploy to get a reaction from anyone who is foolish enough to think it would be this easy. We did not work this long and hard for you to screw it up, Katsuki. Naitai shouted, clenching his fist. If Bakugu did this and failed their anonymity would be destroyed and Bane would hunt them down before they were ready to face him. Katsuki looked through the scope of his gun tightening his grip on the trigger. Katsuki were so close I've seen Dabai's future as well as Killer Frost's, we just need a little more patience. Katsuki slowly dropped his gun before placing it in his holster and standing up as Bane rounded a corner. Fine Naitai you win, Katsuki said walking down the stairs towards his bike. You will get your revenge, Katsuki, and it starts right now. As of now, Joker's hideout is barely manned. She's shacked up with Bane and brought her most dangerous members with her. This is our chance to strike at Bane. We know that Chisaki stored his cork killer bullets there. If you can infiltrate the base and find them, that will give us a leg up. All we need is a few dozen and to destroy whatever is left. So what if we destroy the supply? We don't know how Chisaki was making the damn things in the first place. If we steal and destroy what Bane already has he'll just make more. Katsuki said as he hopped onto his bike, having it roar to life before speeding off down the streets. Nidai sighed before explaining things to his partner. Think Katsuki Overhaul was paranoid to the point he wouldn't let anyone touch him. Do you honestly think a man like that would share the secret to his most powerful weapon? Nidai asked shaking his head. Overhaul no doubt took that secret to his grave because as we both know the Joker doesn't take prisoners. I am positive that if we execute this Bane we'll have no way of making more of those bullets, and even if he can make more it'll take time. Time we can use to take out more of his leadership. At this Katsuki smiled. The thought of killing more of Bane's men filled him with excitement. All right old man you've convinced me. He said as he tore down the road to Chisaki's base. Bakugu stored his bike in the woods at the base of Chisaki's walled-off compound. It was a large mansion atop a hill surrounded by a stone wall that wouldn't look out of place outside a medieval castle. Katsuki pulled out a pair of binoculars and scouted the area. It seemed that Naitai's information was correct the place was hardly guarded. From his vantage point he could make out a half dozen or so guards each wearing either a clown mask or face paint. It was clear that Joker had made herself right at home. This is too easy, he said as he straightened his bomber jacket running through his arsenal since partnering with Naidai Katsuki had come to appreciate the advantage of being prepared. Around his waist was a belt adorned with eight bombs filled with his explosive sweat, and across his chest were two ammo belts for his guns. Across the small of his back was Kabar Ka-1245. Katsuki was dressed in a black bomber jacket with black cargo pants adorned with the knee pads from his former costume and combat boots the final touch being a black metal helmet like a biker's. I'm going in. Katsuki said making his way to the base stalking up from the shadow-covered side before climbing the wall and pulling himself onto the walkway right behind a sentry. Katsuki stalked up behind him kicking the man's knee out before covering his mouth as he stabbed his K-bar into his neck and thrusting it forward severing the man's throat as his blood sprayed over the wall. Katsuki let the man's body drop as he fell over the side. Looking around to make sure he hadn't been spotted Katsuki dropped into the interior of the wall, sliding along the wall, and avoiding the gaze of the guards. Katsuki found the door to the interior right as someone noticed one of their numbers was missing. He smiled as he stole into the compound. I'm in. Katsuki said turning back to the door and pulling a proximity mine next to it before he began to make his way through the halls. I'm sending over what I have of the layout. Nidai said having lifted this information from some of Joker's men when they were away from the base. It was hardly complete, but it was better than going in blind. Katsuki pulled out his phone and looked it over. All right, I'll see what I can find, he said as he went through the halls placing bombs in strategic places as he did so. Apparently the bulk of Joker's people were inside, either she had great confidence in the men outside or these idiots were just doing as they pleased while their boss was away. That worked out for him just fine. Katsuki waited around a corner as he heard a pair of voices. He rounded the corner throwing his knife into the head of one piercing his mask and killing him instantly before charging into his compatriot. A woman by the shocked sound she made as Katsuki rammed her into a wall before grabbing her face and slamming her head against the ground as he heard her skull crack and blood leak from her mask. 
Oh, Kaiken, what are you doing? Katsuki stiffened as his red eyes turned around seeing Izuku standing there. This was the Izuku of the past dressed in shorts and an All Might shirt with his red shoes. He crouched next to the man Katsuki had killed and shook his head. They didn't have to die, you know. You could have just knocked them out. Izuku said as Katsuki growled yanking his knife from the dead man's skull. Yes, they fucking did. I can't risk them waking up and alerting someone. He said flicking the blood from his knife as he sheathed it. Yeah, that's the reason. Get real, Katsuki. You just like hurting people, just like you hurt me. Izuku whispered to Katsuki as he walked along. Katsuki grit his teeth. You're not real, he hissed looking at the layout Naitai had sent him. This had been going on since his first kill. That night last year had brought about this hallucination that tormented him almost constantly. Katsuki shook his head. He didn't want to think about it as he took a staircase down. What's wrong Katsuki scared of something, Izuku said placing his hand on Katsuki's shoulder. You don't want to know how much of a monster you've become. I can understand that. I mean you go out every night and kill people, while Bane has what killed like two people. And you think you're a hero, Izuku laughed. Katsuki turned on Izuku raising his gun. I said shut up, he shouted at the top of his lungs right before he was shot in the shoulder. Katsuki fell to the ground and rolled around a metal barrel, hearing more gunshots ricochet off his cover. Do you have any idea where the hell you are right now? The Joker goon yelled as he popped off a few more shots as he advanced on Bakugo's position. Bakugo waited hearing him draw close before turning around and kicking the barrel he was hiding behind as hard as he could slamming it into the goon's stomach bowling him over as Bakugo pounced on him slamming his boot down on the man's wrist hearing it snap as the gun fell limply from his hand. You son of a bitch take this star finger, he yelled as his fingers shot out towards Bakugo and embedded themselves in his bullet wound. Blast Lung grunted at the pain before drawing his gun and shooting the man in his hand forcing his fingers to withdraw. Bastard, he shouted tearing off the man's mask and saw he had three eyes each a different color from red, blue and the top one being yellow. Listen here shithead, where does Joker keep the quirk bullets, he shouted. He didn't have a lot of time somebody was bound to have heard the gunfire and was on their way here right now. I ain't telling you shit Blast Lung, yeah I know who you are. The triple-eyed villain growled before receiving a bullet to his kneecap. Egg! he shouted writhing under Bakugu who placed the hot barrel of his gun against his other knee. You want to try that again fuckface? Bakugu asked as the man took deep breaths from between his teeth. Where are they? he asked again as the villain shook his head. Go to hell. The three-eyed man hissed as Bakugu frowned beneath his mask and pulled the trigger once again spilling more blood and bits of bone across the ground as the villain yelled again. That's it, this is what you are kakin, even after all this time you're still nothing more than a bully. Izuku whispered in his ear sitting directly in front of Katsuki behind the pinned villain's head. Katsuki grit his teeth looking away from Izuku and down to the villain. You're out of kneecaps so what's it going to be? Bakugu spoke coldly to the man under him as he clenched his jaw against the pain in his legs. I don't know okay. Joker took all those bullets and put them somewhere in the base only she knows. Look man we can't even navigate this place without the map she gave us. It's a fucking maze down here, even if I knew where it was I wouldn't know how to get to it. He shouted before feeling the barrel of Katsuki's gun against his genitals. I don't believe you. Katsuki growled pulling on the trigger slightly as the villain squirming came to halt. Please man I, I don't know. All I know is that Joker has a locked room somewhere at the bottom of the base. No one but her is allowed there. That's all I know, that's all I know. He shouted before Katsuki aimed the gun at his head and pulled the trigger killing him. Wow look at you, what a cold customer you are Katsuki. What's that saying about becoming the monster you're hunting? Phantom Izuku said as Katsuki searched the guy's body finding a partial map, probably this guy's route to patrol. After linking it up with the map Naitai had given him Katsuki rose to his feet heading down deeper into the maze of Joker's base until he came across a large bolted door. He took no time in shooting the locks off and kicked the door open finding a room with several crates inside. Katsuki walked up to one putting his phone away in a pocket before he punched through the lid, ripping it off to see a case of quirk killer bullets. He smiled broadly as he lifted several cartridges placing them in various pockets of his cargo pants before emptying the remaining bullets from his guns and replacing them with quirk bullets. He smiled before he heard movement from his side and dodged out of the room as a blast of wind ripped through it. A boy floated out his eyes manic as he stared at Katsuki. 
He was dressed in a crimson bodysuit with a red cape and a spray-painted yellow tee on his shirt. Joker says I should kill anyone that comes here. He said walking forward and directing two blasts of wind at Katsuki, who dodged to the side firing off several shots at him, only for them to be deflected by the wind. Shit. He growled knowing when he was beat, he took off running down the hall hearing his pursuer right on his heels. He turned a corner and dropped a bomb that went off right as his enemy rounded the corner blasting him with light and sound blinding him as Katsuki made his way back upstairs. He heard the sounds of footsteps running through the base and took a moment to snatch the mask off the Joker goon he'd killed slipping it on and running into the halls being met by other henchmen. Come on we're under attack we need to search the base, one guy said as Katsuki shook his head. I know I'm going to guard one of the entrances. He shouted running off before he could give himself away. Katsuki managed to retrace his steps and make it out the front door of the base. He looked around spotting no opposition he made his escape and once he'd reached his bike he tore off the mask and smiled before pulling out a detonator for the multiple bombs he'd placed around the base as well as the handful he'd shoved into the crate he'd taken his ammo from. He should have brought more, but this would definitely put a kink in things. Katsuki pressed the button on his detonator and smiled as explosions began going off only for the base to begin to crumble and fall in on itself. Well done Kek and this has to be a new murder record. Congratulations, Izuku said throwing confetti into the air before slapping a gloved hand on Katsuki's shoulder forcing him to look at him. Now you're playing the game Blast Lung. Bane said the Izuku from his past gone being replaced by the Izuku of now. And I'm going to win. Katsuki said hopping on his bike and tearing off back into the city. Bane stood up from his training with Yuri as he heard an explosion. The young girl did as well stopping her punching against a mat as she looked at Bane. What was that? Yuri asked walking over to him as Bane shook his head. I don't know. He said walking up to the wall around Yua and leaping atop it to see a pillar of smoke rise up from the north. That's from Joker's base. He said hopping down from the wall. Come along Eri training is over for today. He said pulling out his phone, but before he could call he heard footsteps those being of Compress, twice, and Dabai running up to him. What is it? Do you know what that was? Bane asked as Dabai shook his head. No, but we do know who killed Spinner. Dabai responded. Bane nodded. Meet me in my office. Eri go play. He said before walking off as Eri kicked at the dirt before looking at Ivy's large green house and heading off towards it. Bane pulled out his phone and dialed a number. Hello honey tough day at the office, said Leech as he picked up the phone. Bane ignored the man's teasing. Leech I want you to check out what happened at Joker's base, there was an explosion. Bring back up, he said as Leech dug his ear. Sure thing boss, I'm on my way, he said hanging up. Bane entered his office as the line ended and looked at the three men in it. Go ahead, he said as Dabai stepped forward to explain what they learned about Blast Lung. Bane sat at his desk thinking of what he'd heard and compiling the data in his mind. There's been a rat in my kingdom killing my people and I didn't know about it, he sighed scratching his head. He was losing his edge, not only should he have known about this, but the fact he was oblivious to it up until the point the rat bit at him irked him. Bane clenched his fist as he stood up turning to the window. At times like this he wanted Himiko around, but her operation was too important for him to be selfish. As he stood there hands behind his back his phone went off. He sighed pulling it out of his pocket and saw a blocked number. This immediately put him on edge, only his inner circle should have this number. Who is this? he growled before hearing a feminine voice. Meet me on the roof and see for yourself. The voice said before hanging up. Bane growled as he launched to his feet bounding up the steps to the roof exit and slung open the door to find a hero standing there. The rabbit hero Mirko to be exact. She wore a white sleeveless leotard with purple trim that showed off her powerful build. Bane took notice of her muscular limbs knowing the power they held. She had a pair of bunny ears atop her head that twitched every so often and a cotton tail at her back. Bane growled he knew the heroes had their sights set on him, but this was too much. He would laugh if this breach in his security wasn't so glaring. Bane placed his hand on his wrist to what looked like a watch twisting the face of it three times as it then popped up. This was his latest delivery system for his venom. Once he gained control of Musutafu it was pretty much open to all the black market membership, including illegal support items such as this. Hold on, I'm not here to fight, 
though I think I could take you if we did. She said, giving him a cocky smirk, those red eyes of hers glittering with arrogance. Others have tried and failed. Bane said standing before her. Why are you here, Mirko? Bane asked as the woman frowned. I'm here to help you, help me. She said crossing her arms as Bane arched a brow. What? He asked not believing this for a moment. But she did have him interested. I've seen what you do, Bane, and I know that if we go to war with you, this won't end well. You will probably lose, but at the cost of hundreds of lives. Bane scoffed at this and crossed his arms. You underestimate me, he said looking her over. I'm the only one who doesn't I know strength, Bane, and you have it, but you need inside information if you are to win with as little lost life as possible. Mirko said putting her fist on her hips. So you just want to keep this war from spiraling out of control and end it quickly? I don't buy it. Bane said as Mirko frowned deeper. Bane didn't believe for a second that Mirko was here on a purely altruistic reason. Sure, she may want to save people, but putting herself in the lion's den like this for that reason alone, no, that was too weak a motive there had to be something more. Fine, I have a stake in this aside from the lives of thousands of people. I should have been given the title of number one hero after Endeavor died. Instead, they simply pass the buck to that idiot Hawks. He has no respect for what it means to be a hero. That is not someone who should have the number one spot. She said looking at him. I'll help you to bring that cocky bastard to his knees. She said holding her fist out to him. Bane looked at her as he shook his head. All right, say I believe you. What do you really get out of this? Sure, you can humiliate Hawks, but I don't intend to just take him out and let you build a hero army under you to defeat me. I will kill as many heroes as I can. So what do you want? To be the last hero in a country of villains. That sounds like suicide. Bane mocked as Mirko put her fist down. You're right, there is more. I want you to leave me and my city alone. After you've won your war you swear that my city will remain untouched by not just you, but every villain. I want assurances that any villain who does commit crime in my city, I will be free to handle as I please no matter what. She said as Bane grinned. Quite cutthroat, aren't you? But you can't expect me to believe you right off the bat. You need to have proof you can provide me with real intel. Bane said before a holodisc was tossed to his feet. You're going to have a prison break tonight. Some heroes know about your prisoners and are making plans to rescue them so they can bomb this place off the map. Namely that politician's daughter and midnight. That disc holds all the pertinent information on the operation. Check it for yourself and then wait until tonight. You'll see the info I gave is good, and when you do I expect you to contact me with an apology. She said before leaping into the air only to land on another building hopping off that into the distance. Bane watched her go before looking at the holodisc and carrying it back to his office. Here he sat in Poison Ivy's greenhouse, running around the trunk of a tree before climbing its branches to grab the apple it held and bit into it giggling at the sweetness before sliding down to the ground and turning to a bush. You better not mess with me. I'm stronger than you, Bush, she said trying to sound like Bane as she attempted to intimidate the shrub. That's right, you better just sit there, or I'll break you over my knee. She said tossing her apple in the air, only to have it not return to her hand, and looked up to see it was in Ivy's hand. What are you doing in here? she asked walking past Eri and biting into her apple. That was mine, Eri shouted. No, it's mine, everything in here is mine, so you stole it. Now get out, I have to take care of my babies. Ivy said watering some of her plants as Eerie stood there frowning before walking away before remembering what Bane told her. I bow to no one, and I pray to no god. I am all that I will ever need, and so should you be, Eerie. You can never let yourself down, nor can you let others take from you. With this in mind, Eerie turned around and kicked Ivy in her shin. Give it back, she shouted as Ivy yelped in pain and looked at Eerie before slapping her. Who do you think you are? You may be Joker's little pet but that doesn't mean anything to me. Learn your place, you little brat. Ivy said, pushing Eerie to the ground before some of her vines uncoiled from her body rising above her. Maybe you need a spanking to learn your lesson. Ivy said as Eerie cringed under the imminent assault before she was grabbed and thrown outside of Ivy's greenhouse. If I catch you here again, I won't hold back. She said, slamming the door. Eerie rose from the ground, rubbing her cheek as she felt tears at her eyes. Stop crying. Tears will do nothing for you. She heard Bane's voice in her head as he stood up. No more crying. She said walking back to the dorm that the Joker family had taken over. 
Midnight opened her eyes as she looked around the dark room that had been her home for who knows how long. There were no windows, only a single door. The room was furbished spartanly with a bed being the only. There was a bathroom where she was allowed to clean up after Toga was done with her. She'd tried to keep track of time in the beginning, but had long since stopped. What did it matter anymore anyway? She thought as she adjusted herself feeling her body seize in pain as she did so. Her entire body hurt, but that was nothing new. Himiko kept her in constant pain. Where is Himiko? She thought to herself. She hadn't seen her in a long time, no one had come to see her. She was fed of course as trays were pushed under her door. As midnight was thinking the door to her room opened, her body seized in fear at what was to come. The only person who opened that door was Himiko, and when she did midnight was put through new levels of pain. Midnight looked at the door and saw nothing. Was she hallucinating or maybe having a nightmare? Midnight, a female voice spoke to her, but she couldn't see its owner. Midnight, I'm here to rescue you. The voice spoke again as Midnight smiled. This was just another of Toga's tricks. She'd done this before, back when Midnight didn't realize what her quirk was. She'd transform into someone else and pretend to be here to save Midnight and Midnight would fall for it. They'd run out of the building or take a secret passage, only when they were at the end Himiko would transform back to herself and torture Midnight before dragging her back to her cell. Not this time, Himiko. If you're going to torture me, get on with it. Midnight said. Midnight, what are you talking about? We need to leave like now. The voice said grabbing and pulling at Midnight's hand. I'm not falling for it, Himiko. I'm staying right here. Midnight said pulling her hand free of the phantom rescuer. She wasn't even sure this was real after all. This could all be a dream or hallucination. Aizawa says he needs you. The voice shouted jarring Midnight as images of Shoda ran through her, the last being him falling into a gorge at the Battle of Yua. Shoda is alive, she said getting to her feet and hissing as her body resisted pain rifling through her body, only to feel someone under her arm supporting her and helping her leave the room. Midnight noticed the two guards lying unconscious by the door as they walked past. Midnight hobbled on her support as she heard sounds of battle in the distance. What's going on? she asked as her rescuer remained silent before they reached outside. This was the first time Midnight had been outside of that room. She looked up at the full moon above her, its silver light raining down on them. She smiled as the sounds of battle could clearly be heard now. Let's go! Her rescuer said before a crash was heard in front of her showing that Mirko had arrived. Midnight felt her support disappear from under her, leaving her to fall forward only to be caught by Mirko. Mirko, what are you doing here? Midnight asked as Mirko looked down at Midnight's body. It was covered in deep lacerations, and some looked as if parts of her flesh were carved off. The ragged clothes she wore were stained with dried blood. Scars adorned every part of her body except her face. Midnight's face was the only thing unmarred. Tears ran down Midnight's face as she hugged Mirko. Thank you, thank you, she said before hearing footsteps behind them. She looked to see Bane exit the building slowly walking up to the two pros. Looks like your information was on point. Bane said as he hefted the unconscious form of a girl on his shoulder. It was the daughter of Hero Associate Chairman Kunikata. She was in better shape than Midnight dressed in dirty clothes and looking exhausted, but other than that she was fine. So Mirko, what's it going to be? Bane asked. Midnight looked between Bane and Mirko before she was shoved into Bane's waiting grasp. In an attempt to get away Midnight activated her somnambulist. Pink mist wafting from her skin before Bane's hand gripped her throat. Don't struggle these gloves will tear the skin off your neck if you do. And as for you somnambulist none of it will get through my mask. Bane said squeezing Midnight's throat as she wheezed struggling in his grip. Kicking and punching at Bane. So are we good now? Mirko asked gaining Midnight's attention. I told you about the raid on your base, and I even kept Midnight from escaping. I think I've proved myself. Mirko said crossing her arms as Bane smiled under his mask. You have just one more thing. He said lifting Midnight off her feet and holding her out to Mirko. Kill Midnight and I'll consider us partners, I'll even hand over Kunikita's daughter. He said as Midnight gasped in his hand before being dropped to the ground before Mirko. Use a Jama, why you traitor? Midnight coughed as Mirko looked down at Midnight. Is this really necessary? She asked looking at Bane before crouching down to Midnight. Not really, but I want to know what lengths you're willing to go. Imagine it Mirko the hero of the rescue operation. You couldn't save Midnight, but you did manage to take my trump card, or so they'll believe. 
Bane said as he and Mirko looked at one another. Mirko, how could you? You're a hero. How can you team up with this mom's? Mirko gripped Midnight's face, placing her palm over her mouth. I don't want to hear a lecture from some exhibitionist slut. I am a hero. Mirko shouted, slamming Midnight to her knees before delivering a powerful kick to Midnight's neck. The resounding crack echoed through the night as Midnight fell to the ground dead. Happy now? she asked Bane as the villain smiled. Welcome aboard, Mirko. I look forward to working with you. He said, throwing Cunicata's daughter at Mirko's feet before stepping towards Midnight, only for Mirko to pick her up. Yeah, no, I'm not letting you keep her body. I need something to show the higher-ups after all. If I just say Midnight's dead, with no proof people might get suspicious, but thanks for the live one. She said, walking away after throwing Midnight's and the chairman's daughter's bodies over her shoulders and vaulting away from Yua. Mirko landed in an alley laying both bodies down as she heard bare feet approaching her. Oh my god, what happened to Midnight? Toru shouted as she kneeled next to the hero, only for Midnight to cough and gasp as she fidgeted. Miss Midnight, thank god, you did it Mirko ma'am. Toru said saluting her hero before noticing the other girl in her boss's care. You even found the chairman's daughter. This is great, now we don't have to hold back anymore. Toru stated excitedly. This was a big step to taking down Bane and getting their city back. Mirko turned and threw up. That was awful. She rasped emptying her guts more. Midnight's body looked as if she had been in a butcher shop. And though Mirko put on a brave face hearing Midnight's neck snap like that as she kicked her nearly made her vomit, but she'd held her composure. Thank God for that paralytic rendering Midnight's body completely relaxing Midnight's body so she could take a kick like that and only have it appear that her neck had broken. It was still a disgusting sound to hear. Mirko stepped away from the wall looking at Midnight as Toru placed a blanket over her. She's free, and now Bane trusts me. Everything is going as planned thanks to you, Toru. Mirko said placing her hand on the invisible girl's shoulder. Let's get out of here. Mirko said as she and Toru took Midnight away from this hell. Bane looked at the two men who'd been set to guard Midnight as they were slammed on their knees by the rest of Bane's forces. Did the heroes make off with anyone else? Bane asked one of the men present who shook his head. From what we saw Sir Midnight and the chairman's daughter were the only targets. We don't think they know about Joker's captives. Bane nodded before turning to the men before him. Boss, please, give us another chance. It was an accident. We were guarding Midnight and then someone knocked us over the head. One thug the spines along his back prickling as his cohort fell forward. We won't screw up again, we promise his stone-skinned companion added. Bane put his hand on his fist as he looked at the two before him. Fine, I'll grant your request, but only to one of you. Bane said before tossing a venom patch on the ground. One of you takes that and kills the other. If you do, I'll let you live. If it was up to him alone, he'd have let them live. After all, it was always his position to have Mirko kill Midnight to prove her loyalty. But she was one of Himiko's favorite playthings so he couldn't just let it go without giving Himiko her pound of flesh somebody had to be punished. He thought watching the two men before Stone lunged for the patch, grabbing it only to have his hand stabbed by his partner's spike and take it from him and slapped it on his chest. The spiked villain huffed and doubled over. His Stone companion wasted no time in bringing his fist down upon his former partner slamming down on him again and again before he was impaled by the enlarged spines coming out of his partner as he reared up a hulking spiked monster. Bane stood from his chair looking at the spiny monster before him as he tore his partner off his spikes. You get to live, he said walking away as the spiked beast roared as Bane left to his office as he did. The heroes are getting bolder. The longer I sit here the more they feel they have the right to come at me. I need my army now, he shouted and out there somewhere was some killer taking down his men. First spinner now who? He asked himself staring out the window as it started to rain. Leech drove through the streets with his men. I don't know what the boss man is so worried about, so what if Joker's place got blown to bits no skin off our bones? He said with a sigh. Oh well what the boss wants the boss gee. Something exploded next to Leech's ride blowing the car onto its side and throwing the villain from it. Leech slammed against a wall the wind knocked out of him and his vision swimming. He sat up coughing as he saw someone approaching him silhouetted by the flaming wreckage of his car. Blast Long raised his head Leech's face reflected in his mask. Welcome to hell you piece of shit.